can you tell us something more about the current work that has been going on in your working group? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first Positive Energy District European Network uh, Urban Stakeholder Workshop. My name is Maria Beatrice Andreucci from Sapienza University of Rome, the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture, and a warm welcome to everybody. I will now share my screen. We will briefly go through a quick glance of the program. But first, we will have to greetings and welcome one from the director of the department, uh, Professor Laura Ricci, that I will be reading on her behalf, and the other one from our chair, Dr. Vicky Albert Seifried. So I will be delivering now the quick and, and brief uh, welcome from the director, Professor Laura Ricci. Professor Laura Ricci is an architect and urbanist and full professor of urban and territorial planning and design. She holds a PhD in urban and territorial planning. And since 2015 is the director of the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture of Sapienza University of Rome. She will be opening today's webinar with some reflection on sustainable urban transitions and its relevance for the cultural project of the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture, a warm welcome to the Cost Action Positive Energy District European Network, chair, participant, researchers, and public officers from Italy and Europe. Uh, thank you for joining uh, um, us today and tomorrow for this two-day workshop on positive energy districts. And we look forward to your expert insights and perspective on the very crucial topic of gaps towards urban transition. It's a day to be celebrated. It's the first time that we have the opportunity to meet uh, in person as well as uh, virtually. And so I'm very sorry I will not be able to celebrate with you today, uh, but really I think it's, it's a memorable day. I would like to express my greeting and thanks to all uh, colleagues of the Cost Action and Maria Beatrice Andreucci, my colleague here in Sapienza, and the uh, co-organizer um, from, uh, from Enea, uh, Paola Clerici Maestosi. The challenges of sustainable urban transitions are many and urgent. The work of crafting lasting solutions towards decarbonization and climate neutral city, however, has only just begun. Sustainability isn't just about energy efficiency or technological innovation, it's about sustaining the human communities that animate our districts and neighborhoods. The internal health, education, behavioral, and socioeconomic harmony of any given community must be addressed alongside its external relationship with the environment. In this sense, I believe that the pro-environment, pro-development divide is obsolete, and then the future of sustainable urban transitions lies in the intersection of the two. To the extent that environmentalism has become a polarizing word, I believe that both its proponents and, the, and detractors need a fundamental shift in thinking. At the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture that I'm leading, we strongly believe in raising new generations of students, researchers, educators, public officers, and citizens who take an active part in this virtual process. From November the 1st, I will become the coordinator of the PDTA doctoral program in Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture. And I will continue in that direction the cultural project I activated and implemented for the last six years, 
since 2015, carrying out educational activities aimed at meeting the demand for scientific and humanistic training, as well as cultural and professional lifelong learning, coming from a wide range of experiences and competencies related to the holistic and evidence-based enhancement of our urban ecosystem through the project. I will now conclude my greetings, thanking you for the attention and wish you an intense and fruitful workshop. Thank you very much for, for this uh, um, message, Professor uh, Laura Ricci. And I think now I can uh, uh, ask our chair, Dr. Vicky Albert Seyfried to share her screen and give us her welcome. Please Vicky, the virtual floor is yours. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me well? Very well. Yeah. Good, super. So yeah, so I think um, I would like to really um, thank you, um, all of you for joining us today and especially for those who are um, actually um, joining the in-person meeting in Rome. Thank you very much for really taking the effort to be there despite these um, COVID restrictions. Um, so I am not able to um, join you, unfortunately, in person today because of my little one here. <laughs> but um, I hope that um, in the near future, I will be able to also see you um, in person. Um, so this cost action, Positive Energy District European Network aims to support the development of pets and to help meeting the set plan ambitions of creating 100 positive energy districts in Europe by 2025. And of course, we cannot do this on our own without the city and stakeholders on board. So this workshop and um, brings together the researchers and the stakeholders, city stakeholders, to try to identify and discuss the gaps in the development of PET. And I think this is a really, really important step. And I hope that um, this discussion will not end in Rome. And instead, it will turn into a longer term um, cooperation between our researchers and the city stakeholders and in this journey of pet transformation. So um, I'm not sure if um, everyone knows what um, the cost action is about. So I think I would like to make use of this opportunity to also give you um, a, an introduction um, about us. So I would like to now show you uh, my screen. Um, right. So, um, Patricia, I am not able to share my um, screen. Um, would you be able to allow me to share the screen? Yeah, now. Super. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes. Right, great. So I think I will just go through um, a few slides to show you um, what our um, action is about. So um, you heard a lot about COST. So COST has actually stands for the Cooperation in Science and Technology. It is a, a framework, um, a European framework to um, support the open collaboration and between um, researchers and, and, and all other relevant stakeholders on specific topics. And the aim is to really strengthen the capacity of Europe to address scientific, technological, and societal challenges. And um, in this course action, as I said, we support the development um, of PET, and especially by um, sharing of knowledge, exchange of ideas, and pooling resources, experimentation of new methods, and also um, co-creation of um, novel solutions. So in our network now, and um, so we actually started roughly a year ago, and the action will run for four years. We have now already in, in one year, we have grown our network now to um, a size of um, over 180 participants. They are coming from over 130 organizations from um, 40 different um, countries. As you can see, we have a very wide um, like geographical um, distributions in Europe and also in the neighboring countries. Within our network, um, amongst the 180 more, um, more participants, most of us coming from engineering background, from different disciplines of engineering, 
And then, um, but we also have um, quite a number of um, people coming from architectural and planning background. In addition to that, we have also a number of participants from um, a really um, various disciplines, for example, um, economics, business, um, natural science, political science, social science, and computer informatics. And then out of the 130 organizations um, that they represent, most of them um, are research and development institutes. And we also have um, quite some people coming from the business industry sector and a smaller um, representation of the municipalities and governmental organizations. And this is why um, this event today is very important because we hope that through this event, we can really strengthen our connections and to um, with the municipalities because they are really the problem owners. They, um, and we really need them um, to support this, um, this um, development. And so um, I hope that um, after this event, we will have um, uh, an even higher number of municipalities within our network. So um, the cost action is led by a core group. At the moment, we have 11 people. Um, many of them um, you will see in these two days because they will also speak in different sessions. Um, so you will probably get to know them better just through um, this workshop. And in this cost action, um, basically the structure is that we divided the action into four main working groups. Um, you will hear more about the working group later in, um, in uh, the um, working group presentation. And I will just quickly give you an overview of them. So the first working group is about mapping. We map um, of different um, important um, elements um, of PET. For example, we map um, the PET cases, the PET characteristics, definitions, best practice, and so on. And then in working group two, we look at guides and tools. And um, this cover both the technical and non technical aspects of um, the guides and tools. And then working group three is about pet labs. So um, we look at the um, urban living labs focusing on pets. But in addition to that, we also look at the monitoring, evaluation methods, and um, KPIs um, related to the pet labs and pets. And finally, we have the working group four who is looking um, at the dissemination. They are um, particularly um, focusing on stakeholder engagement and also developing different kinds of um, dissemination material. So for example, the event today is mainly initiated and organized by working group four. Right, so um, about the action activities, we actually organize very wide range of activities. So today um, we have the workshop and we also organize scientific conferences. And with the working group, we have regular working group meetings. And for um, we have also a group of um, people who, are, who have joined the management committees, which we have also regular meeting twice a year. In addition to all these meetings, we actually have other activities such as training schools. And we will um, probably have training school um, open next year. And we also have um, actually funding for um, research exchange and also um, for conference um, attendance. So um, you can find out more information of all these activities in our website. Yeah, so the last thing I want to show you is how you can follow us. If you would like to find out more about our activities and our, um, yeah, basically everything about our, our um, action, you can um, go to our action website, which I have the address here. We are also present in, um, on the Twitter. So you can also follow our Twitter. And any of you after this um, event, if you would like to actually join the action, please just contact me and then um, I, will, um, um, I will follow you with the, push, um, the process of an um, application. So I think this is the end of my presentation. Yeah, so I think um, finally, I just would like to um, thank um, Bratisla and also um, Paula, who initiated the idea of this workshop and also um, organized such a very nice um, program for these two days. And um, I would also like to thank the, um, the, P um, the Pienza University of Rome to host this event. And last but not least, I would like to thank all the, the core groups for your support. Um, 
think it is very nice that we are able to now organize our first um, in-person meeting after a year of the start of the action, and I'm really happy about that. Um, so I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. And for those in Rome, I hope you will really enjoy this in-person meeting, this opportunity, and stay healthy. I think that is so. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky, uh, our chair, for uh, this uh, very encouraging message. Uh, we have two dance uh, day ahead, and I'm glad that we managed also to start the session two. Starter, a common feeling, understanding about PED quite sharp. So uh, I will now share again my screen. And uh, Paola, Clerici, my Susie, and myself uh, will briefly guide you through um, the program. So um, again, we, we will be uh, trying to understand uh, and frame these, uh, uh, today's uh, workshop. Um, because you will see that the cost action has been implementing several uh, workshops dedicated to different stakeholders. Um, brief, uh, some uh, general rules. Please uh, keep your audio and video off at all time, because this will be, uh, is, is, uh, we are in a meeting mode on Zoom. So please try not to disturb the others when speaking. Uh, but you can always use the chat box to suggest questions or comments to the speaker. The workshop is recorded and will soon be available on the PEDUNET website. And you have received, I think, already notification when the recording starts. And if you uh, wish to stay, you have to accept that the, the workshop uh, is uh, recorded. Um, we had uh, this uh, nice welcome from uh, Laura Ricci and Vicky uh, Albert Seyfried. Um, and I think that now we can deeply go in through what we are going to do in these two days. Uh, the event is fully blended, so we have the opportunity also to offer to the virtual participant the interactive part, as we will see. But let me first frame why we are here today on, on working on this specific and very important stakeholders uh, uh, group. Um, as uh, Vicky said, uh, um, th this event has been organized by Working Group 4, Dissemination, Outreach and Exploitation, which as you see from uh, uh, the, the, the composition of the action in four groups is actually supporting uh, looking at these main challenges, which is harmonize, share, and disseminate knowledge and breakthroughs on positive energy districts across different stakeholders. So not only academia or industries, but mostly cities and communities, the one who will put in place the positive energy districts, but also across several domains, technological, social, economic, financial, legal, and rich regulatory and sectors, buildings, energy, mobility, and ICT at the national and European level. So within this uh, uh, framework, uh, the deliverable 4.3 uh, is actually what we are doing today for the first time, but we will see that we will be doing that for four years, uh, um, one, one event after the other. So among our tasks is the coordination of action conferences, workshops, PED information day and training school. So here we are today. Uh, I also wish to thank uh, all participants who already attended the first webinar on positive energy districts only a few weeks ago. Um, and I think it is important that somehow we keep the momentum and we try really and bridge, uh, notwithstanding the difficulties due to COVID, uh, um, our interests and our focus on the topic. So here you see basically uh, the entire flow of uh, um, PEDUNED workshops, conferences, a webinar, the way Working Group 4, is, together with the core group of the action, has been implemented. So not only we had already, um, you, many of you already attended the, the SEP21 Sustainable Energy and Building uh, uh, event, uh, this is under stakeholders group D, so an event dedicated to all uh, researchers. Uh, 
uh, we had it already virtually, and this event was jointly organized by the Cost Action and the International Energy Agency um, Annex 83. Then uh, uh, that's why we're here today. So we are here where you see the red arrow. So today, actually, this event is dedicated also, as said, to cities and community. But as you will see, we will have many, many other events, uh, including conferences and other workshops dedicated to all different categories. But I would also come back to this later on when presenting working group for activity. Uh, so we start now with the impulse send in to the workshop and I will ask uh, uh, Paola to provide some comments on uh, how the two days uh, briefly will be developed so trying to identify a few rules uh, you can open up your microphone yes, yes. please okay where you are now the fil rouge I'm lost a bit okay here okay yes sorry um, so, um, um, the idea uh, of this workshop we shared with uh, Maria Beatrice was, of course, to start from the definition of uh, PED, uh, the three uh, pillars, uh, energy efficiency, energy flexibility, and, and energy production. A and the aim was to, to connect um, urban stakeholders. So uh, the, the uh, actors who will uh, form the uh, stakeholder ecosystem for PET. So that's why we started uh, uh, discussing uh, um, a way to uh, focus our attention on GAP. And this will be the fil rouge the, uh, of the two days. Um, we have organized a program involving, uh, uh, of course, uh, the members of, uh, of course, starting from their knowledge, ambition, and whatever. But then we uh, even decided to uh, find some um, actors, some stakeholders who are related to uh, the energy chain. Uh, so to start to think and to even to the business model and funding. So to start a discussion uh, with a different point of view. So the session number two uh, will host, first of all, our friends Christoph Goldner. Uh, many of you know Christoph. Uh, he is uh, in charge of... Uh, uh, development of, uh, of uh, contents for PED pillar, which will uh, be part, one of the three pillars in the Driving Urban Transition Partnership. Uh, he is the author, together with uh, Silvia Bossi, of a uh, uh, booklet on PED. And uh, we have asked Christoph to participate uh, to better highlight um, and provide an overview of what's going on on, uh, on uh, the topic of PED in Europe. Then we will have uh, the section. Yeah. Then we will have uh, the section Impulse 2, uh, where all the cost member, uh, leader and vice leader will present uh, the activity. And uh, the Impulse 3, uh, which uh, will highlight what is going on in the area of research on PET in Italy, so in Sapienza and uh, in um, Guinea. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, as you have seen, uh, this session two is actually meant uh, to provide some input. So this is why uh, we will be developing kind of uh, um, different approaches, say, from the general European overview to a strict focus on what the working groups uh, are focusing on, and then also to understand uh, what uh, will come next. Sì. A te la sessione Okay, so Likewise. the session three, yes, sorry, we, we <laughs> um, uh, then we will have a focus uh, on that on the center of topic. Uh, we have invited several um, civil officers, civil servants from uh, European municipality 
to work to to work with them on the topic of gaps and uh, this section is uh, uh, there is a sort of parallelism on the same type of section that we will have in the second day because here we decided to have a european overview and then uh, uh, we had the opportunity to highlight and give some elements of reflection on what is going on at national level to, to um, highlight how each of you can work in the same direction, of course, if you agree on this, uh, at your national level. So to, to reflect these two positions, the European, the international, and the national one. Yeah, uh, in session four in the afternoon is actually the interactive, is actually the interactive part I was mentioning before. So we have defined uh, the section uh, which will happen in person here. Uh, we will be using the work cafe methodologies, but the same will happen during the virtual session, which is organized again on Zoom rooms. We will have four different tables here in Rome and four different Zoom room uh, uh, working on mural with all the participants. So uh, I, I think this is quite relevant because we need somehow to include, I mean, cost means cooperation in science and technology. So, so it is very important and, and we're really doing our best uh, to include uh, as many people as possible. As you can see here also, there will be a further plenary exchange with the wrap up provided by each uh, work cafe table rapporteur. Those are our uh, working group uh, vice leaders and our virtual uh, networking manager, but also from the people who will be hosting the tables uh, uh, virtually. Okay, then um, we, we need to announce uh, uh, Christophe Golner. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think we can we can carry on starting with the with the presentation of uh, our uh, working group uh, leaders. So uh, I will. Um, well, actually, no, no because okay. because I think we we need to follow <laughs> a little bit uh, the the program, otherwise we, we mess up the, the communication. So Christophe Golner, uh, considering that uh, we are early, um, because we, we have been missing maybe some some direct communication. So I think considering that the working I group leaders are, yes. is online. Yes. Oh, great. So I think- I am, I am. Fantastic, thank you, Christophe. <laughs> Paula, please. Uh, okay, so uh, Christophe Golner, as I've already said, uh, is, uh, colleague uh, which is deeply involved in the development of contents uh, of PED. So Christoph, welcome. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. You can uh, directly share your screen. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christoph Goldner. I'm um, coordinating program manager of the set plan action 3.2 JPI Urban Europe PET program. I hope you can see it. I have been invited to give a short overview of the European landscape, um, the European background of positive energy districts. And yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to kind of open up the next sessions with that short overview. Um, why are we all doing this and why are we focusing very much also on urban areas? And this is probably just a reminder to you that the cities really play a crucial, cru crucial role in both adapting to climate change, facing the, and tackling the challenges. But of course, cities are also the, one of the main sources of the problems we are facing. So cities are really the place where we need to take action and, um, if we manage to do that, I think we will be one step closer or an important step closer to achieving the goals that have been set. 
positive energy districts. Um, first of all, uh, on the European level, both on the European level, but also on the glo global level, very ambitious targets have been set. I'd like to mention, of course, first of all here, the European Green Deal with the goal of having a climate neutral Europe by 2050. And initiatives uh, uh, and, and programs related to that, the New Horizon Europe framework with the mission on climate neutral and smart cities. Uh, attached to that, but also other um, other goals set in the urban agenda, um, in the new European Bauhaus, renovation wave, etc. But also, of course, on the, on the global level, we have the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, uh, we have uh, the new urban agenda and and other goals being set on the global level. So the ambition, the policy ambition, is clearly there. And I think we are really in a, in, in, in a situation where the ambition to, to, to really uh, address the challenges uh, is really high and a lot of things are, are moving in that direction. Uh, what are positive energy districts playing? What role do they play in, in, in this process? Uh, I don't wanna go into the into the definition of positive energy districts, I guess that will be part of uh, sessions to come. And it's an ongoing discussion, but they have a function. And positive energy districts, as we see it, um, may serve or will serve uh, as a tool for urban transformation processes towards climate neutrality. Um, I'm not going through the definition again, as I said. Uh, but the real goal and the real um, positive, uh, the, the, well, the real asset of positive energy districts is that they provide a concrete tool, a concrete structure, a concrete um, instrument uh, to implement for cities towards uh, uh, these uh, climate neutrality goals. Um, in 2018, the PET program, the program on positive energy districts and neighborhoods for sustainable urban development has been launched with a mission of 100 positive energy districts, uh, the support of the development of 100 positive energy districts in Europe by 2025. But this approach is embedded in a very comprehensive approach. Uh, as I said, to see positive energy districts as a part of urban strategies towards climate neutral cities and to create, and with that having a tool for creating or livable, sustainable, inclusive urban neighborhoods in the context of integrated urban strategies. So it's a rather broad goal and the implementation plan of, of the set plan action 3.2 also mentioned that um, all different aspects like uh, uh, social aspects, technolo technological aspects, environmental aspects, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, uh, will be considered in the development of the PET program. The focus of the program uh, is, of course, it's a research and innovation uh, program, maybe one step back. Uh, it's a, a transnational intergovernmental uh, R&I program. Um, and a joint initiative between the Strategic Energy Technology Plan and JPI Urban Europe. Um, with that, of course, uh, one of the key focuses is the pooling and upscaling of national uh, R&I funding towards PET implementation with a call agenda of roughly 100 million euros until 2025, but very much also creating that impact beyond uh, research projects mainly focusing on capacity and, and community building regarding technology, process design, governance, participation, um, with a clear focus on the support and empowerment of what we call problem owners, mainly the cities themselves, but also the real estate sector, the utilities, civil, working together and co-creating with civil society, with bottom-up um, initiatives, um, and of course, other uh, urban stakeholders. But one of the key ambitions we need to have is really to give these stakeholders the, 
the opportunity to really uh, uh, work in the field of, of uh, climate change action and, and, and energy transition. Uh, so the program really focuses on that with the goal of creating that European-wide PET ambition and a, and a, and a PET community. And as we will see in a minute, uh, there is a growing community already. Um, we're working in, just to shortly give you uh, 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 that information, we're working in three main um, areas, um, key fields of action, as we called it, call it, uh, preparing the energy system for PETs, integrated urban planning, governance, pets for people, and preparing mainstreaming and replication, probably one of the, one of the most tricky parts. Um, the program, the PET program will be uh, integrated as a so-called transition pathway in the upcoming prospective driving urban transitions partnership on the Horizon Europe. Uh, the DUT partnership, um, aims at being uh, the place to, 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 to connect and, and address the challenges uh, of um, urban development we are facing currently. And the integration of the PET pillar uh, emphasizes that integrated approach because um, next to the positive energy districts uh, transition pathway, there will be one on circular urban economies circular urban regenerative economies and the 15 minute cities and together to create these integrated approaches for the urban transform for urban transformations so this is just to give you a clue um, what's hopefully coming up next year this, this submission deadline will be the 19th of October so fingers crossed that everything um, goes well I mentioned that we do have a growing pet community in Europe. Um, in the PET program, we have uh, developed a booklet on uh, positive energy districts. Uh, you can download the booklet. Probably most of you have seen it or have, um, um, have uh, went, uh, went through that. Um, in that version from last year, we have uh, more than 60 cases of projects working towards uh, climate neutrality, not all of them specific uh, positive energy districts, but there is a lot going on and there is much more going on than represented in the, that booklet. We will make an update, hopefully shortly. Um, so the ambitions are there, not only in the framework of um, of uh, um, individual uh, projects coming out from calls, but also very much by initiative of the cities themselves, um, of on or national initiatives to promote the idea of um, positive energy districts, but in general to 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 make um, cities and urban neighborhoods more sustainable and ready for the challenges to tackle. Um, Apologies from the beginning if I have, might have uh, not included all initiatives and projects that are out there, but I tried to give it at least a, a, a short a, a glimpse of what is what is going on, and that is a lot. Um, as I said, it's it's a growing community. We have uh, research and innovation networks or related uh, um, programs and initiatives. Um, very much dealing with um, uh, with the pet topic. We have, of course, uh, the city networks uh, in Europe also contributing to these ambitions, and we're closely working together with them. And we have the projects that are currently going on. I just included the project uh, projects from um, the currently ongoing Lighthouse projects that are dealing uh, with positive energy districts and the four projects that uh, came out as a result of the first PET call by the PET program. The next call will be coming up in the next weeks, very soon. So um, this is, this community is continuing, is continuing to grow. To grow. Um, what we do need is really joining efforts towards our common goal of climate neutrality. And 
we do have very good approaches. We have to work together on different levels, on the European level, integrating the national levels, integrating very much learnings from the projects um, that are going on with the demonstrators, uh, with the demonstrations and their learnings and, and their different approaches. Uh, so this cooperation between the, uh, the initiatives, the networks and the projects uh, and the successful cooperation in that, in that sense will be one of the key um, drivers for positively managing that challenge. Um, just giving you an example, of what we're already doing regarding joint forces. Um, there is a set plan action 3.2 framework definition for positive energy districts, but the ambition to further operationalize this um, framework uh, definition is been being done in a in a in a uh, alignment group between a lot of different transnational pet initiatives you can see in the top right um, working together and trying to integrate and bring together the different approaches regarding the definitions that are out there coming from local projects coming from national uh, pet strategies and coming from these transnational mostly research oriented or oriented um, pet initiatives to overcome the gap in comparability uh, uh, between different uh, pet approaches and to really um, get to a, a joint um, understanding of what is a pet. Uh, so this is basically just an example of uh, how we really try to, to, to bring forward the cooperation between the initiatives. Um, and to conclude, Pets are on a mission, on a mission towards climate, uh, climate neutral Europe. Uh, again, the steps with uh, 2018 having uh, the set plan action 3.2, including the, mem the member states, technology platforms, city platforms, research platforms established. Now we have the big panorama of different initiatives and projects going on with the aim of creating the synthesis in, 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 the, in the respective works. We have the mission of 100 positive energy districts as a kind of building stone or, or, or step towards um, the uh, mission uh, of 100 uh, climate neutral and smart cities by the um, mission on climate neutral and smart cities. So um, I guess we're all ready for this journey. We are on this journey and I hope we will do it together. With that, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please come back to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, and actually, considering that we have a few minutes, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we are in Rome in Italy, we are in advance with the program. This is quite surprising. Uh, must be the post-COVID uh, mode. Um, <laughs> So I kindly ask you uh, if you want, if you wish to, to ask some questions to, to Christophe, both to the virtual audience and, and the people attending here. Yeah? Please come. So we have uh, Agatino uh, Rizzo asking a question. Thanks, Christophe. Thanks for the presentation. You mentioned that there is going to be a call but I, uh, for positive energy districts. Did you mean it was for JPI Urban Europe or something else? Yes, it's a JPI Urban Europe call okay. from the PET program. The PET program is part of JPI Urban, Urban Europe. It will, be, it will be a call by JPI Urban Europe. Yes. Uh, my name is Aldin and I'm coming from Bosnia. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Christoph. Uh, may I ask you a question? Is it possible that a non-EU country be part of a positive energy district, yes. like yes. you mentioned? Yes, it absolutely, absolutely is. Okay. Okay. Write, okay. write me an email and if, if you're interested um, and we can, if you're interested, we can start the process. Yes. Yes, we are. Maybe, maybe as he is here, Christophe, I will uh, explain. I give him more news and information. Exactly, and yes. 
he will come back to you. Okay, is it right Perfect. for you? Perfect, yes. Okay. Paul is, uh, is, is the chair of, of of the set plan action, vice chair of the action. So that's the perfect place to talk. So any other any questions? other question? And from the audience, I think no, nobody. No, I, I cannot read okay. anything on the chat. So, so we, can, we thank so very much. Thank you very much, Christoph, for coming today earlier than <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> was, was lucky that I just arrived in time. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. In the next days. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a very good day. Stop Thank sharing you. the screen. Yes. <laughs> First. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. So I will now share again my screen because now it's coming. Uh, uh, we are um, going. Okay. <laughs> I think we are here somehow. No, we are here. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so now is the turn of uh, the um, working group leaders uh, to present uh, uh, their activities. This is again another impulse, and uh, we will be uh, offering some state of the art in terms of the activities the working groups are focusing on at the moment. Um, so I will ask uh, uh, the leader of working group one, Michal Kuzmik. Um, is the leader of mapping characterization and learning. Um, Why we'll be listening to, to the vice leader, uh, Paolo Civiero, uh, later this afternoon. So please, Michael, I will, I will actually help you in uh, uh, sharing uh, the screen for you. So you can, you can just sit here. Assuming that I can exit from this, uh, it's, not it's not very easy, <laughs> not very intuitive it's when the computer is not uh, yours, but I finally managed, so bear with me. Okay. Yes. So please, Michael, the floor is yours. So good morning, everyone. Uh, from my side, on behalf of uh, Working Group One, I will spend next, uh, let's say, 15 minutes with you. I hope you can see the presentation. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Beatrice for organizing this blended event, uh, because it's nice to see the familiar faces after a long time. We were just discussing that last time we met was in Bolzano in 2019, so it's been quite a long time. And uh, going this extra mile is like very much appreciated. So uh, it's been an exciting year with uh, the cost action with the working group one. Uh, here you can see the, the diagram of the tasks we are dealing with. I will not be able to mention all of them in detail. Uh, I'm happy that Christoph in the previous presentation mentioned the work on the definition, which actually uh, goes together with the task 1.3, which is led by uh, Vicky Albert Seifried, the chair of the cost action. And where is the work on the common pet definition really crucial for how actually the, the pets will be assessed throughout Europe and uh, actually how the ambition of individual projects will look like, because we see in practice that the definitions could differ a lot. And in the end, the, the practical impact on fulfilling the, the goals and the climate neutrality goals is very much different uh, uh, between the, the projects and the case studies. So I started with task 1.3, but coming back to uh, task 1.1 uh, that focuses on the comprehensive pet database. I'll be talking about that uh, most of uh, my presentation. Uh, it is run by Beryl Alpagut for, from Demir Energy and uh, Julia Turci together with Daniel Alongo from Unibo. Uh, and also with contributions from uh, many other members of Working Group 1. Then we have task 1.2, uh, which uh, focuses on identifying and compilating main pet characteristics and key performance indicators uh, run by, by Abel Magyari. I'm happy to see him here in Rome as well, uh, together with uh, Viktor Bukowski from Abud from uh, Hungary. Uh, and those three tasks are the most active ones uh, at the moment. 
for the uh, next uh, upcoming years until 2024, we focus on uh, further deepening the knowledge about the challenges and barriers and actually capturing the lessons learned and providing some recommendations. Um, that, that will be my task and Paulo Chiviero's task will be to devise the roadmap for the implementation uh, of pets in the short to medium term. Paulo is also here in Rome, so I'm happy we can have this also as a working meeting. So um, now I'm actually getting more into a detail with the pet database. I wanted to use this opportunity to kind of uh, spread the awareness of the work that's being done because we are closing in uh, with releasing this, uh, let's say a first viable version of the database um, in coming, uh, let's say two months. Uh, the, the main uh, idea behind the database is that it should serve as the vehicle for learning it should be a vehicle for the whole cost action and also for our partners uh, outside the cost action. So the scope is to provide data, data and the, on the state of the art of the development in pets. And we focus also on not just pets, but pet relevant projects, or as Christoph called them, uh, the towards uh, pets uh, projects uh, and case studies. Uh, so we have two target groups, the municipalities and the researchers. It's always hard to, of course, combine those two angles. Uh, so uh, fingers crossed that we will manage that. And uh, I would like to mention some key aspects of the database before I get deeper. Uh, one is uh, that we would like to use actually the potential of the cost action to get as much contributions to the, to the database from the beginning as possible. So soon we will be opening, um, opening this for contributions from individual cost action members to actually uh, use their connections towards the projects and case studies to actually start filling in the database. Then we'd like to maximize the partnerships with other initiatives, which I'll be talking about more. Uh, and of course, the result should be open data database accessible to everyone. Of course, I have this in brackets once cleaned. That means that, of course, not everything is directly going to the database. There has to be some review process. And uh, we now have a plan to, of course, to maintain the database in the cost section until September 2024. And we are already uh, starting discussions on how this will be maintained afterwards. So I just mentioned that combining those two perspectives of municipalities and researchers is not always easy. Uh, it's uh, different, different goals, uh, different, uh, let's say, um, aspirations that people may have. And uh, from the municipality point of view, um, the, the main maybe purpose is actually to, to look for similar examples to learn from, to, to browse and get inspired, and of course, to, uh, to get the practical information. So uh, this, is, this is what the city practitioners need actually to start with developing pets and actually to find peers that they can share similar characteristics of their sites. I don't know how many of you can recognize the pet in the, in the picture. It's, it's from the Sparks project. It's the Dunkerviertel in, in Leipzig, one of the very interesting cases. And for the researchers, of course, it's about seeking the information and data to compare, analyze, to look for patterns and of course to disseminate knowledge and for most of the scholars also to publish. So this should be a source of, of data. Therefore, uh, the pressure to have, let's say high quality of definitions before we start the collections. That's what we spend the most time on uh, in the last months and alignment of those definitions is very tricky and detailed work. So uh, there are more aspects to it. Um, we, we are discussing the, the framework on, of the database, which was agreed uh, before this summer uh, and actually it turned into a deliverable of the cost section. Uh, then, of course, as I mentioned, we uh, are still working on uh, clearly defining uh, the, the par parameters that will be collected in the first information and data collection. Uh, that's that's the first segment. The second segment is the IT solution itself. The IT solution uh, also has some some aspects to it. We are talking a collection form, also we call it questionnaire, uh, that will be embedded into the database and that we will use for collecting the data. And of course, for that we need also some backend because, as I said, we there will be some review process in the backend uh, from the admin side, and we need some user interface. So we are working on all those three things simultaneously in last months. 
Uh, and now I can say that we are closing in to have, as I said, this minimum viable version that we could release. And information collection process itself, it's another thing that, uh, as I said, we'd like to maximize the potential of cost action. And I mentioned specifically here the Annex 83, because they are a key partner to this, as we share many of the goals and also a member, member base. So to look deeper in how we are uh, preparing the database, okay, of course, the core of it are the case studies. The case studies can be either uh, the, the projects or actually the case studies are the sites, the demonstrations or the pet sites that are both pet ambition or pet relevant, or they can have a pet lab status, which is closely discussed with working group three. I'm happy that Oscar is also here, so we can discuss more. And uh, so this is the core, actually. We need to start with this core to, to expand the database in the coming years. Uh, next thing that will be part of this, let's say, basic package that we would like to put together first is uh, bottom left, uh, the project and initiatives. Actually, in one project, you can have more case studies. Therefore, we will have this dynamic in the, in the um, uh, database that you can switch between the project view and the case study view. And then for the future development, actually, we are already uh, planning how to integrate national policies, tables, technological solutions, and non-technological solutions together with working group two. And Savis is also here, so we can discuss everything, actually. So um, I think I should be a bit quicker, right? <laughs> But perhaps uh, just to, to give you a, a, let's say overview of how we proceeded. Of course, we first to, had to define the, the scope uh, through some internal workshops uh, in the cost action where we actually gathered ideas from different <laughs> partners, how to actually structure, uh, structure the, the whole thing, how, what purposes it should serve. And um, one, important aspect of that actually uh, was that we uh, parallel in parallel to the database, we need to develop this glossary that will be actually also embedded into it. Uh, so each, let's say, complex concept uh, needs to have a definition. So the, when filling in the, the forms, you will uh, have um, definition to refer to. So uh, so this was one part. The other was actually to map the potential of the cost action itself, screening the projects and initi initiatives. I'm very grateful to Julia Turci, who uh, did lots of work here, classifying the, the projects between pets, pet relevant, uh, non-relevant, and uh, actually some that we need some more information about. And actually this list is still growing. So this is what we will be working with. And now, of course, it's time to um, put this into uh, online, uh, let's say, application. Um, so uh, the, the idea is that, of course, the questionnaires will be uh, module-based. There will be sections uh, that are dealing with specific aspects of the case studies. Uh, I will be presenting them on this slide. Actually, in section A, we focus on uh, global characteristics and technological aspects and non-technological aspects. In section B, which is divided between pet and pet relevant case studies in detail, we focus on some characteristics that are specific to actually case studies that are already implemented as, let's say, uh, non-experimental or as a you know, final final projects that uh, kind of um, do not have primarily research ambition, while well, PED labs uh, have this experimental aspect. Of course, there can be case studies that are both, uh, that are both for like, actually living and using and actually for experimenting and researching. So this section allows to collect information and parameters on both. And section C is on drivers and barriers. Here I'm very thankful for uh, input from so from uh, working group three and from Annex team, because uh, we collected perfect input from Daniel Vettorato uh, and um, uh, others from the, from the Annex team. Uh, sorry if I don't mention everyone, there's many people participating. So I hope you will, you will uh, understand it. <laughs> so, okay. Now 
let's have a sneak uh, short peek uh, at, the, at how it looks at the moment. Uh, at the moment, we uh, are still tuning this online form that will be used by the input form editor to actually uh, fill in the, the basic uh, information about the projects. Uh, as you can see, the example uh, the definition should be part of it directly, so, so the respondents should refer to, to the definition directly. On the left, you can see the global characteristics examples. Also, you can upload some pictures. On the right, uh, general projects and initiatives. So, and uh, here are the first mockups. Um, of course, as, as you are probably used to from other projects, from other databases, uh, we will start with the map, which is always nice to have uh, some geographical representation of what's going on. And uh, of course, uh, the, the idea is that this will be an interactive tool. So uh, there will be modalities you, you can choose between uh, different types, if it's PET or PETLAB uh, phases, planning phase, implementation phase, operation phase, uh, and of course, uh, between projects to see, um, to see we just have some dummy files, uh, dummy entries right now. So, uh to see which case studies are part of which project so this is one part one possibility to view the other one is of course the the table view so here uh, you'll be able to browse through the case studies uh you know order them as you wish uh, filter them and uh click on them individually also what i do not have on a slide yet, but uh, which is foreseen as a, as a feature is a comparison mode where you can put several case studies next to each other. So we will be able to actually have in a user-friendly format this possibility to compare several case studies. And here is the view, let's say, of um, how the, um, uh, you know, uh, the list of parameters towards one uh, case study will look like. Uh, this is the Greece case study number one. It's just a dummy case study. Uh, with some filled in values. And what's important that we aimed from the beginning to for a possibility to export uh, like a single sheet of the single case study into PDF or export as a CSV, either one case study or a combination of several. So you can work with it for your research or for your comparison when you're a municipality and you want to have several case studies next to each other. And I think this is never enough to, to repeat. So uh, let me thank everyone who uh, is participating in this uh, exercise within the cost action with the working group two. Uh, we are working on the alignment of uh, both technological and non-technological tools, the guides and tools. And in the future, we want to expand the database with the, let's say separate tables when you would be able to list, uh, to, sorry, to browse the different tools and to go through them individually with their characteristics based on uh, how we def uh, decide with working, working group two. With working group three, as I mentioned, the PetLab characteristics and um, actually also the input form layout is based on the first version that was developed in CMAT. And working group four, actually, that's uh, the reason why we are here today. Uh, that's the opportunity to, to meet with the pet stakeholders and to discuss this in detail. And uh, to partners outside the cost section, the, the Annex 83, uh, we already went through in-depth alignment of different parameters. Uh, I'd expect further collaboration, further alignment uh, of the, actually the whole presentation of the data collected. And then we got uh, very good feedback from Christoph from GPR Urban Europe, uh, whom we went through also some initial scoping. With Smart City Marketplace, uh, we, we, part, we work on outreach outside the pet unit. And with ERA GPSC, actually, that was the enabling condition to start this work, actually. So we are happy to, to have ERA GPSC supporting this effort. And so where to go next? So our to-dos for the coming uh, weeks and months is of course to finalize the form and the interface, which is ongoing work, starting the first information collection and synchronizing with partners. Um, I'm positive we'll be soon getting back to working group one members, all of them uh, to start this collection. So uh, you can expect that uh, we'll be looking for dates for this uh, workshop. 
And uh, then, of course, uh, we will be on the strategic level clarifying the long-term maintenance and sustainability beyond 2024. And to be discussed here in, let's say, maybe the roundtables in the afternoon and other occasions, uh, how to steer the database in the long term, because uh, we want to keep it useful, of course. We want to keep it growing uh, and alive. And uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, it should not just be a uh, repository of information and data, but uh, in the end, if we add some practical uh, features, it could serve as a learning tool, tool for municipalities, and maybe it could be even friendlier for researchers as well. So those are all the top topics for, for this meeting. So I hope I wasn't too long. Thank you very much. And you know where to reach us. Hello, everyone. My name is Nien Kamas. I'm working at the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, TNO. And together with Savis uh, Gohari, we are leading the working group two on pet guides and tools. And for implementing pets, it's very important that uh, those pet guides and tools are fulfilling the needs of the uh, people who are dealing with the positive energy districts and that the tools that will be developed, that they really do what the participants would like to do. And it's my honor to present the working group to you um, and to do so, I will share my screen. Yes, um, pet guides and tools. Um, and what we would like to deliver. is uh, and we have the objectives on uh, to identify existing technical and non-technical guides and tools which can support both the design and planning and the operation of the positive energy districts it's very important that it's both because it's not just about designing and planning but especially with pets the energy balance and the operation of pets is very important and with this work generate insights into the development of new guides and tools um, by doing this work, we would like to contribute to harmonization and advanced knowledge development of positive energy districts. We would like to consolidate the guides and the tools so that it's clear what can be used and could be used to really optimize the pets. To support activities to close the gap between disciplines, of course, with this cost network, establish a network of researchers and pra uh, practitioners. practitioners and disseminate and train and learn. The approach of this working group is to, in the end, devise a conceptual framework on the development of this new type guides and tools so that a researcher and practitioners who would like to, to use and develop new tools know how they can be interact with each other. But before we can do so, we need to know what the main needs are and what the existing technical and non-technical tools are. So we started with those two uh, activities, so identifying needs and identification of existing technical and non-technical tools. What have we done so far? We have finalized a paper on seven challenges, which is focused on implementing pets. The implementation of pets is a uh, uh, is one of the most challenging uh, elements of a pet, I would say, because it's not just designing, but because a pet needs to be interactive and interrelated with all other kinds of uh, district uh, needs. It's very important that it's good aligned with all different type of activities in the city. We started with an inventory of technical tools where we started with energy modeling tools, but of course there are more tools that need to be, uh, need to be identified. We have started an inventory of implemented social tools and potential for replication, which is as well a virtual mobility grant, one of the learning tools, networking tools that is part of the cost uh, action. And we have two STSM related to this, uh, working group, uh, which is related to um, uh, energy management systems, 
when it comes to the implementation of energy management systems and uh, one that is related to scalable energy communities. And energy communities is one very important part of both the energy regulation and uh, both for creating pets because of this local balance of energy um, power and supply. Um, one of the things that we would focus on today is the challenges, the existing challenges that exist. And what we did is identify among uh, uh, a lot of researchers by a um, Delphi study, what existing challenges each of us know. And we put them back into seven uh, typologies. One is on governance, so the need for new and innovative forms of collaborative governance. One other challenge can be um, centered around incentives because it's very important that there is a need for right drivers and motivators to really get these pets uh, going and to uh, implement them. Um, when it comes to the social part, it's very important. That's why I focused on the energy communities that there is a need for local community support and engagement. Of course, because a pet is not just there, it needs to be integrated in all different type of planning procedures and decision making approaches. Not only one person needs to decide about a pet, but there are different stakeholders that there and their decision making processes need to be aligned. One very important aspect is the market. So is there an appropriate market design and a business model where it comes into value to really deliver these pets. An important aspect is as well the technology, but we put them on number six instead of number one, because in many positive energy projects, the technology uh, people are uh, upfront and we think it's very important that as well, the technology is, um, is, is one of the aspects that's important, but especially the need for balancing energy demand and supply systems is one of the key challenges uh, when it comes to implementation. And um, another challenge which is very important is a need for considering regional and local differences. And uh, what we would like to do in our World Cafe session is to come back to some of the challenges. And we have some questions that we would like to uh, focus on, which is about uh, how we might develop a collaborative governance, which is dynamic, inclusive, and context-based. So it's related to several of these challenges. And which gaps can you identify? Another question is how might we integrate decision making and planning processes to be more effective? And a third one we would like to focus on is about how might we attract community support in pets? Related to those challenges, we think it's very important that the community's attractiveness for positive energy districts is key. And uh, of course, all those challenges are related as well. So I have a final picture just as a kind of overview where you can see the interdependency and overlap between those challenges. So it's not that if you solve one challenge that uh, you have solved that in, in itself, but that it's because the interrelationship uh, you need to, to look into those challenges from a more systemic perspective. And I'm very curious about all of your uh, ideas about the gaps between um, and the things that we need to develop and how tools and guides can be uh, focused on it. Unfortunately, I cannot join you today. So I hope that uh, you will do your very best so that uh, when we get all the results of this, meeting and this interesting workshop, we can uh, really get a step further into the identification of pet guides and tools, the challenges and ways how to overcome those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you there, uh, Ninke Mas. Uh, now I'm proposing to you a change of the program because our working group leader working group number three 
uh, is on Ped Labs is on her way from uh, the airport. So I will now present uh, working group four. Yeah, uh, working group four is uh, said is on dissemination, outreach and exploitation. I have already somehow anticipated some relevant aspects, so I will not be taking long because I, I already mentioned some relevant aspect referring to the, to the workshops and the different stakeholders we are uh, looking after. Uh, certainly it is important to qualify and remember the main challenge we are facing because of course, uh, this is a rather complex task and goal that uh, we set to ourselves when we decided to, to activate the action. Um, I think it is important to understand as far as the working group four activities are concerned that we are working actually on two different levels. We work internally because we coordinate somehow the investing and pooling of knowledge within our network as was already explained by our uh, colleagues, but also covering niche scientific areas. I think this is exactly the, the, um, the situation we, we are having here in the workshop. For instance, uh, Working Group 4 has been developing the investment funding and business model aspect, scientific aspect, which uh, uh, quite intuitively are not normally covered by uh, the, the, the standard scientific member of, of this action. But also externally, because it is extremely important to disseminate uh, to different audiences, raising the awareness of pets and highlighting relevance to different stakeholders, because we will be listening later on also to, to uh, another intro very important introductory uh, speech on, on how much, when, when we're dealing with stakeholders, we're not just mentioning a few, but we need to identify first and find also as a matter of communication, the right skills that we need to communicate to them. So as to ensure the transfer of knowledge and translation of experience behind, behind the network. So here again, I think it is important to uh, look, uh, uh, this, the, the, the yellow one is the one we are uh, dealing today, so to facilitate the science policy communication, which is already, I think, quite an hard task uh, to accomplish. Um, but as said, uh, we will come back to you uh, in the very near future, in the next uh, following weeks, uh, because we are already starting planning with the colleagues of the core groups about conferences and other uh, forthcoming workshops for early uh, 2022. Uh, in terms of uh, participants, uh, working group four is this one, is, is the smallest one so far, but we are growing especially because we are attracting also uh, very young uh, researchers who can find under the guide of senior researcher of the action, a good opportunity to attend and per actively participate. Um, together with Savis uh, Gohari, who is uh, leading the short-term scientific mission, we are also developing specific projects aimed to them and also finding specific opportunity for dissemination targeted to this very important uh, uh, member, member group. Um, the BG4 composition is quite balanced. We roughly have 20 uh, different countries. What I would like to stress here is actually the composition. So we need to attract more city. We want city to talk. I think that when with Paola Clerici, we started thinking about this event, uh, we didn't want the, the standard workshop whereby only researcher talk, but actually we wanted to talk as, as little as possible to give the floor to the municipalities and to the other urban stakeholders. And this is very, very relevant, I think. Um, I would like to thank my colleagues. Uh, I'm very sorry that the working group vice leader, Mary Hukalainen from Finland, VTT Finland, is not with us today. Unfortunately, she is sick. So my, my best wishes to her. But also to thank the, our science communication manager, Sidar Sarin, who is very active in the communication because he's uh, the one looking after all those aspects. Uh, and congratulations to him because he's, uh, he's a new baby has just arrived um, and to our virtual networking manager that we are waiting she should be on her way uh, Jelena Brajkovic so uh, thank you very much I think this is it uh, 
uh, as far as uh, working group four is uh, concerned. Uh, I think now uh, we are, unfortunately our colleague uh, Gazale Minan is still on her way. So I will uh, ask uh, Oscar Seiko who will uh, present uh, instead of Gazale Minan. Please, uh, please Oscar. Thank you, Beatrice. <clears throat> Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, meeting in Rome, this Congress. This is uh, especially an opportunity to present what uh, is ongoing in the working group three for this uh, cost action 19126. First of all, the leader of uh, the working group three is Edmin Al-Ghazal, but uh, unfortunately uh, today in Rome is <coughs> running and it's too hard to arrive to everywhere. So in case of her, I'm gonna present the ongoing working group three. Here we have uh, everyone, the task leaders, uh, the leader, the vice leader, and the uh, substitute leader in case of it's needed. Uh, we have 53 min, uh, members of 22 different countries and in the whole Europe. And actually, uh, we have one more member from Australia. So <laughs> it's a European uh, coast, but we have uh, one member out of the European side. <clears throat> we made a uh, four a workshop and the structure of this presentation is what is going on in this workshop. The first one just was the kickoff meeting of the cost. <clears throat> we present what uh, uh, the budget, what we want to do, what say uh, this is focused on the working group three. The five questions to have uh, different ideas, uh, about to define what is the pet lab, what tools we need some pet labs, uh, which uh, stakeholders needs to be on board. And in case to have a very big uh, expression of what we need in the working group three uh, and how many people or stakeholders of different countries we need to be on board only about pet uh, labs. The second one was more focused on what is one pet, what's a dynamic pet, what's a virtual pet, and almost a candidates of pet, pet labs. This was uh, the second one with uh, different uh, <coughs> break rules about the stakeholders. And there we uh, regarding to Viktor Budkowski, uh, did a, a really good uh, work about the stakeholders in different uh, break rooms. And here we have uh, the graphics uh, about the different senses, the which actors benefit, about the different questions. We made a online uh, virtual questionnaire, and this is the result. The same on the other hand, uh, regarding to uh, Daniele Vettorato, we made the same about the drivers and barriers. <laughs> the definition of the pet labs existing uh, some templates from the another different groups uh, regarding to pet labs. And this is the result of drivers and barriers, uh, driving the motivation and locking elements, what's ongoing and uh, Many people contribute that, and this is uh, more or less the results that we had it. The first one was focused in uh, three points. The, the database, the survey, because we think at the same day from the working group one, but we need a, a very big, but a, a not very big, just a, a database with the uh, different uh, pet, pet cases, pet projects, and in the case of working group three, only pet labs. How many pet labs? 
different kinds of peddlers and uh, different uh, uh, situation or how big is it or what you need is uh, different kinds of peddlers it is quite complicated. First of all, uh, we made an STSM brainstorming to know how many people or to put uh, some interesting in the people who wanted to start uh, 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 this STSM uh, uh, motivation. We make uh, some question, what is the potential potential host uh, for the working group C and the potential topics. In this case, the people who are joining in the working group three can see uh, what uh, topics and what different places that you can go. So if anybody is interested in some topics or some uh, host that we had in the working group three are really welcome to the working group three and uh, can join it and, and ask about this uh, type of call. This is the uh, relationary with the questionnaire that we made it uh, in, the, in the mural. And this is the result of this uh, mural that we have it. So if anybody is interested, just can contact. And um, the last one is the working uh, is the workshop for <laughs> is focused on the deliverables that we have to have in September of this year. So we have done it. And the first one is review of existing concept projects and facilities that we are relevant to pet labs. This is uh, regarding to Daniele Vettorato, uh, Victor Buzkowski, and Silvia Soutullo. And the second one is review of methods in monitoring, evaluation, and replication of PET and PET labs. This is regarding to Elsa Demir, Beril Arpagut, and also Silvia Soutullo. Uh, about the, this is the, that we just uh, done, the, this is the work that we did it. This is uh, the liberables are in the in the teams folder, and this is the work that we done. Actually, we are going to show what is ongoing. Ongoing is in the <coughs> about the template that uh, we talk about in the first or second meeting from the uh, uh, survey to have a pet labs database about uh, how many pet labs that we have. First, uh, we had uh, some normal templates in Word uh, template, but we had the uh, concept that we need. After that, we go, we wish to the CMAT uh, facilities to do, uh, to pass this uh, concept of a survey to know more about the pet labs to do it on online. After here, we try to, to, to work with the working group one, want an excellent uh, uh, survey information, uh, alignments and everything. After that, with the working room one, we go through then to uh, Annex 83, and we are doing a very big database with PET, PET lab, PET cases, uh, PET projects, and actually uh, we are beginning with the with the Annex 83. After that, we have this done in the CMAT uh, with the, our facilities from the cost action <clears throat> uh, regarding Michael and Michel, sorry, um, Paolo, uh, we go to the boutique, is the web page from the cost action, and we make the same, but the biggest and the child as we wanted to do it, because it's easier and it's a whole uh, a work from the cost action and the regarding from the working group one and three. The 
the other thing that we have to to finalize is the we almost done the, the, the is review the methods and monitoring evaluation and replication. This is the second uh, deliverable, and this is one thing that we want to include <coughs> in the concept of the pet lab and doing something like this because this is re uh, really regarding for the future and the smart cities and district heating. So with this, uh, our ta another task that we, we want to put on the, this kind is the comparison of the monitoring and evaluation. It's a matrix of brain mentioning. Okay, this is the, uh, the idea, the new idea that we have to implement it in the new one. The practical operation, this is for the future. Uh, we use the MC Teams files folder. We have a tail course, a periodic tail course. And the next plan, the next steps is to prepare a plan for the task and organize meeting and alignment, a new alignment that we had it. And of course, if we have to the deliverables, we have to write down for the scientific papers and going uh, with the other task leaders for the next task. And, and just this uh, ongoing, this is the, normal uh, uh, the, no, the normal uh, preparation and practical guide for the working street. And this is the task leader, the people who want to say to stay in different tasks. We have five tasks and actually we are in the third task. So if anybody wants to go on the coast action working group three and is interested in any task, just please contact and are very welcome. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So I would like to ask whether there are questions from uh, the audience uh, and the presence uh, participants for the groups. I don't see uh, specific uh, questions now. So now is the turn of uh, uh, providing you with some uh, snapshot uh, regarding uh, what's going on on the specific uh, uh, topics relevant to positive energy districts here at the, at the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture. Uh, I will ask, uh, uh, well, Tiziana Ferrante actually just sent me a message. Unfortunately, she, she couldn't leave uh, uh, the, the, the semester teaching has just started. So I will uh, uh, consider that uh, I'm also involved in, uh, in her research group. So I will be presenting the work she developed uh, recently with Enea. Um, Tiziana Ferrante is a full professor of technology of architecture and principal investigator together with Teresa Villani and Eleonora Di Manno of this uh, work package, local energy district of the project technologies for efficient penetration of the electric carrier into end uses. This work was developed again together with Enea. Um, the role of municipality in research, development, and innovation projects transition to sustainable urban areas. Uh, this project was developed in five different stages. Um, you see that the first one has been actually concentrating on a strategic uh, uh, study uh, according to different uh, ongoing research initiative, uh, um, including JPI Urban Europe, J JRC Science Hub, uh, uh, the era joint program of Smart City, cost, uh, of course, uh, the, the cost action uh, PED unit, and, and the booklet, which was already relieved at that time. Um, actually, as an outcome of this first phase, it is important that uh, the researchers have been able to um, develop an analysis of the indicators of the booklet. And this task was actually developed on 57 different urban areas, uh, seven of which uh, were uh, Italian. As a third phase, uh, um, this was actually working on the KPIs implementation from booklet uh, on PED. And this has allowed to identify the contribution of municipalities and strategies to promote the transition to urban sustainable uh, 
uh, areas, the relevant sectors which were involved, the stakeholders at system level, programs, processes, and implementation phases, as well as innovative technological solutions proposed and tested. Um, again, as an outcome, this was extremely important because this was uh, some identification of case study, but mostly the validation process of new indicators. And the last, the fifth and last phase is uh, referred to the proposal for the filing uh, of enabling factors. And I think this is uh, probably the most important outcome of this research, which uh, will be, of course, this was only the first uh, here the, the activity was developed, but, but the activities will be uh, carried out also in the, in the near future. And this five, these, these enabling factors are actually at the core of what we are looking for, because in order to contribute to the evolution of sustainable urbanization and further advance towards the refinement of the concept of, of PEDS in place at European level, of course, this is uh, uh, the core of the activity. Um, also, a focus was again on innovative technological solutions. As said, that we focus here on uh, technology of architecture, but also the processes that have made possible the planning of sustainable intervention and their design. As said, we are at the Faculty of Architecture, and you can imagine that for us, of course, the focus is how we can take all those enabling factors and translate them into action as far as the design and planning and design process is concerned. But also the development, the implementation, and mostly the management, because of course this is uh, sometimes uh, uh, an aspect which is not carefully taken into account. So different profiles uh, of the different uh, uh, 57 urban areas have been uh, identified. Here you have uh, uh, some portrait and the relevant uh, uh, information that have been uh, identified and systematically uh, assessed and, uh, um, and developed. Um, I think it is important to, to, to make you an example as an outcome of, of this uh, process. And this referred to the, um, the towers uh, uh, of Madonna Bianca in Trento. Uh, I think this is also very relevant from the social point of view to stress uh, how much uh, uh, it is important because you have to imagine that this complex in a small city uh, compared to other uh, Italian uh, cities uh, in Trento, it, we are dealing with 14 buildings, uh, 500 families and more than 1,400 inhabitants. And if you think uh, that there, there are uh, important projects in terms of retrofit of those buildings for the benefit uh, of this population of different uh, uh, also social and economic uh, status. It is very important how this whole concept of sustainability looking not only say at the environmental but also the social and economic aspects can be integrated. So I think this is uh, what, what I briefly wanted to tell you about this project. Uh, and of course, we will come back to you later on also for further steps uh, uh, of this project. Yes, so sorry, I would like to, as uh, uh, we work, of course, with, uh, with this group of Sapienza, uh, if you can come back to the last slide, I would yes, like to please. emphasize the importance of this part of analysis. <laughs> As actually, uh, um, we have understand that what is missing, uh, at least uh, among some municipality, is uh, the knowledge of uh, a speditive approach to the development process. We are full of rules, regulation, and, and public procurement and whatever. So uh, this is why we have identified, we have decided to work on this aspect as these are actually a sort of enabling factors uh, for the transition to our pets. So to reflect on these uh, uh, elements and to understand how one city uh, have solved the procedural uh, criticalities could be an added value for other city who have uh, more or less to approach the same topic. Just for instance, if you think to the 
topic of public procurement and you have to write the characteristic and the specific of a new building, of course you can write it down and then there is the phase in which you start to work at and to create a new build the building and then how the how it is possible to verify the processes how it is possible to verify that at the very end the results are the same or the or the project fees so this is what there is behind this approach and of course for this uh, type of activity a uh, uh, faculty of architecture is what we need the support from an faculty of architecture is what we need so thanks again to this uh, link we have been able to create thank you thank you very much paula for integrating this and thank you for uh, tiziana ferrante for providing uh, this uh, uh, presentation now i would I'd like to call my colleague, Professor David Astiasso Garcia from the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture. Uh, David is, uh, is, um, uh, works in the disciplinary sector of thermal science, energy technology, and building physics. And he will kindly offer today some snapshot of uh, uh, his own research. Please, David, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. For inviting me today. Thank you, Beatrice and all the group. And uh, and first of all, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so first of all, congratulations for your very interesting uh, project. Uh, I think this opportunity of construction is a very uh, good uh, um, possibility for, uh, for, uh, for researchers, industries to, to create networks. Uh, I thought of, about um, a participation in something similar. And of course, congratulations for the, for the topic, for the focus on, on positive energy district that uh, it's one of the, the key challenges and for the energy transition, I, I, I think in the next years, also considering the, the um, distributed generation of uh, energy to increasing the, the penetration of renewables, starting from the buildings, from the, the, the smaller uh, plants. Uh, I, I work on similar uh, topics in, in uh, actually in uh, uh, four uh, European project currently ongoing, and uh, I would like to, to briefly present uh, mainly one of them um, that is, uh, I think is related with your research, so it can open some uh, possibility of discussion, interaction, and I will be more than happy to to, to discuss with you or to, why not to have a further collaboration through uh, Beatrice with our department. So, uh, of course, uh, working in the same department is easy for us uh, to interact with uh, other colleagues or other um, institutions coming from previous uh, researches. So, uh, this research has, is, uh, um, uh, it has been funded under the, the Interreg Med uh, call, uh, Interreg Med program. Uh, the, the, the research is called the Prismi Plus, Plus because um, we received the previous project in, nine, in 2017 uh, for the decarbonization of small islands in the Mediterranean. The project was Prismi. And then the Interreg Med program asked us, I, I am, Actually, the, the project coordinator, I was the project coordinator of Prism, and now I'm the project coordinator of Prism Plus, to extend what we did with the previous one to in other territories. And so they opened a new particular call, opened only for some specific projects, asking to implement the same activities. And in our case, we developed a, a tool uh, for... Um, fostering the energy transition of small island, they asked us also to apply 
uh, to tailor this tool and to apply to make some modification also in uh, rural areas or remote areas because at the end if we we speak about uh, uh, small islands or also some um, energy islands so called it's not important that we the, the, the context of a geographical area and or a mountain uh, uh, rural areas or remote areas because more or less the, 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 the application is the same. So uh, we started with uh, some partners that already that were already involved in the first project and we opened uh, to a new ones for applying the, the and, uh, and modify and improve our research toolkit in, in other areas, including the, the rural ones. Um, the project is quite small in terms also of duration of uh, 16 months and the number of, uh, of countries. And uh, so we invited also the, the other so-called giver partners, other couple of universities, and then we invited the new receiver that uh, were the area where this, this uh, application uh, will uh, be done. Uh, the, the, the aim of the, um, so we, we included the two islands and two rural areas. The, 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 the aim, one of the aim of the project was not only to, to apply uh, in new territories, but uh, to transferring the knowledge from the, the so-called giver partners to the so-called receivers in order to, to use this, uh, I think is one of the aim also of many European program, uh, not only to apply something in a territory and give the outputs, the results to the municipality, to the local institution, to the stakeholders, but also to, to, um, uh, to, to give them the knowledge to continue in, in this uh, research, to modify the research, to implement it in the future without the support of the university. So with their own legs. Uh, so that's the reason why we, we foresee uh, some training sessions, some guidelines, some transferring tests for understanding how much they understood or not, and then uh, continue the, the transferring process until the, the good, uh, a, good, uh, a good result. So actually the project uh, going more um, closer to your uh, to the topic of your uh, cost action uh, starts from an analysis of uh, the territories uh, at a small scale so it's not a positive energy district but maybe can be a, a, an interaction a network of some positive energy district in a, in a wider area uh, so we analyzed the local community needs in terms of, uh, of course, energy, energy needs, first of all, but not only energy needs, also uh, the territorial characteristics of the, of the areas, the, the local constraints. As you know, the, the small Mediterranean islands are usually are, um, protected by natural constraints. Uh, most of them are marine protected areas, are protected by landscaping constraints. So not it's not possible to, to install, is to use each kind of renewables that are available. For example, if we would like to install maybe uh, two megawatt wind turbines in uh, Favignana Islands or in, in Lisola, any other islands, uh, Italian or Greek or, uh, or Spanish, uh, most probably it's not possible, at least in our country. In some Greek islands, they installed also some wind turbines, but in particular cases also in Spain. Um, but I don't think it will be allowed in, in other, in other contexts, also in, in, in your country. Uh, and then we, we analyze so that the potential of renewables concretely feasible to, to be produced. And then we try to, 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 to give a, a strategy uh, according also with the, the, the SECAP, uh, um, um, the Clean Energy Island Transition and all the, the, the European documents for uh, improving their sustainability, producing renewables in their own territories. Most more islands are not connected to the, to the national grid, other, uh, yes, but in any case, they, they, they are considered as um, living laboratories for uh, the renewable uh, for the energy analysis. 
So we, we, we make some adjustments, uh, applying also in some rural areas in, in, um, in Croatia and in Bosnia, and in some other islands like Ventodena in Italy, in Isiros in Greece. In the previous project, we analyzed the Favignana, Malta, and other Mediterranean islands. Uh, we applied it also to other, other territories, uh, so-called flagship cases, uh, three in Spain, uh, and another couple in Italy, and, uh, and one um, uh, in, uh, in Croatia. Uh, so the, the, we, we try to implement as much as possible the replicability. I will now, in, in the last 10 minutes, more or less, will introduce the, the methodology and the concept of the project uh, that starts from a new methodology, a new methodology we created uh, a couple of years ago um, that includes uh, some pre-processing tools and post-processing tools in order to integrate different kind of information uh, in, a, in a single uh, toolkit and provide, uh, at the end of the procedure, provide the local institution, uh, decision makers, policy makers, provide them some uh, strategies to, to, to be uh, realized in their territory. Uh, of course, we analyze also the, the economic analysis, the economic cost of the intervention, and, uh, and usually three different scenarios, the so-called uh, business as usual, what, has, what are the trend in each specific territories, the medium uh, renewable penetration and the high renewable penetration. And we have seen that it's not always better to, to push to the high renewable penetration because in some cases the, the cost, the benefit and the cost in terms of economic, in terms of return on investment, also in terms of the cost of carbon avoidance is higher in the renewable, in the high penetration rest. In some cases, the level is so low, so we cannot pass from a very low level of uh, uh, renewables of decarbonization until 100%. We have to reach it step by step, of course, uh, also in terms of, um, of cost. Uh, so at the end, we, we help them also to elaborate the, the, the so-called SECAP, Sustainable Energy and Climate Action Plans, in order to, to give a, a, a tool for, for policymakers. So uh, these are the, the main steps, the main um, parts of the methodology. Of course, we first of all, we analyze the, the renewables uh, available in the territories and um, using GIS databases and thematics map and new tools we elaborated. And then we make this, uh, this scenario. Uh, lastly, we will uh, make also another, another tool we will develop it. We, we developed uh, about the, the local grid, because uh, as you know, the, the grid in most of, of the, the areas, excluding maybe the, the TSO, the one of um, uh, the, the, the bigger, the, the high uh, voltage uh, lines, uh, we have a line that is, uh, we have a grid that is uh, designed, that has been designed for, uh, not for renewables, so not for, micro micro generation distribution so in, case, in some cases we have to analyze if the solution we have found we have highlighted um, can be supported can be accepted by the local grid otherwise uh, uh, to to apply to 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 realize that uh, that strategy is also necessary to consider an, an implementation of the local grid that's for uh, that's important for for finding uh, for analyzing all the, the aspects. Otherwise, the, the, uh, the, the research will remain also theoretical and not physically uh, applied. Um, so we made some thematic maps. Uh, these are some examples of the Favignana Islands in the south of Italy, it's a small islands uh, in the west side of the Sicily coast. And uh, <clears throat> Of course, uh, analyzing the solar analysis, we, we considered mainly the, the surface of the roof. The con we considered the, the possibility to install PV plants in the available and not under historical or landscape constraints. And we try to avoid the agricultural areas and the natural areas. We consider also marine renewables, the wave power that can be usual, which used in, um, in, in this context, and, and the wind power 
and the wind the power analysis uh, using developing a new tool um, called the wind power calculator. Of course, it's an open access as uh, every output of uh, a research funded by the, the European uh, um, Union, uh, it has to be free for, for, the, for uh, all the ones, all the stakeholders, all the ones who would like to, to use it. Uh, so we, we adjust it because it was a more difficult with wind compared with uh, PV. And that is much more easier to, 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 to assist the, the, the energy electricity production, the early electricity production on the, or the monthly one. Uh, once we identified the available surface. So then we, we integrated the, um, all the data in a, in a software. Uh, this is also an open access software called Energy Plan. It has been developed by the Alborg University in, da in Denmark. And, uh, and uh, this uh, software allows uh, to, to, to get some interesting outputs also in terms of uh, fuel consumption, electricity production, electricity import and export, excess of production of electricity that is important in some cases because as you know, renewables are variable uh, source of electricity. So we do not, we do not have always the, the, the match between the production and the consumption. So we consider also energy storages, we consider power to gas, we consider to the integration of the vehicle fleet with uh, electric uh, vehicles, uh, public buses, hydrogen buses, every kind of scenarios. Uh, this is an example of the load flow tool I just mentioned where um, including the electricity production, the output from energy planets, uh, we can find if there are some red lines of the grid that are not uh, able to, to host the, 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 the production of electricity. Going faster to some scenarios, uh, these are some uh, demand average for the three scenarios I just mentioned, the low renewables, medium and high. Of course, the demand in the small islands, almost all the small islands have a curve like the one you can see here because the, the, the production, the, the needs increase um, significantly during the, the summer months, uh, of course, mainly for tourism activities. In the high res scenarios, the, the need is higher because we foreseen the, the introduction of heat pumps uh, for cooling, um, so uh, the, the electric cooling and also the, the vehicle fleet is uh, electric vehicle fleet. So it increases also the, the, um, the demand. Uh, and of course, in the higher scenarios, we have, uh, we consider as, as I mentioned, the, the wind, the solar, the hydrogen for the energy storage for matching um, consumption and the production and the vehicle to grid solutions uh, considering local uh, electric vehicles. Uh, so for each scenario, we analyze also the, the rest share in electricity production and the carbon avoidance cost that uh, as you can see is uh, higher in the high rest uh, scenarios compared to the, to the med renewable scenario. So we, we saw that um, to optimize the cost of uh, carbon avoidance, to avoid the, the, the emission of CO2 uh, and other greenhouse gases, of course, the, mess, the, the medium scenario is more effective because we have a cost of 30 euros for a ton of CO2. In the high, we have 50, so, so almost the double. Other outputs, the, the critical um, excess of electricity production, comparing the uh, the, the variable renewable production with the local consumption, the electricity demand, the vehicle to grid demand, the renewable production. So you, you can see that uh, the, we, we tried to, to integrate some more technical aspects and some more uh, easier um, friendly ones uh, to, for, for, the, for the administration. So the project is uh, still ongoing until the next uh, May or June. And, uh, and of course, uh, we will be happy to, to cooperate uh, with, uh, with Beatrice in, uh, and also with your institution, because I think our, our topics are, are seniors. And uh, of course, the synergies is also is always uh, an added value for, uh, for all of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And maybe some questions for Davide.
Yes, Tino, please. Yes, please do. Uh, thank you so much. It was very interesting. Uh, what's the next stage? This project is one year. Uh, what is the plan for future uh, continuation? Plan, I, my, my plan is to, is to, uh, as you can see, like, this is a theoretical, as you have seen, it's a theoretical project because of course we tried to contextualize in real life. So we considered the cost, we considered the, the local constraints and, and everything that for, for applying. But the, the, the next steps that I would like to do in the next Interreg Med program that will be launched maybe next year with a higher amount of euros, because this is, a, the Interreg Med has three different kinds of project, the study project, the implementation, and the capitalization. So we started with a study and then now we would like to implement it. So to find a pilot case to apply the release or to install, to have the money to install some PVs, some uh, electrolyzer or for uh, the hydrogen production and to make a real application and then to match the real data with the ones we foreseen in our tool. That's the, the, the next step. We. Actually, we already started to do something in another project that is in Horizon 2020 that is ongoing in Procidal Island that is called Geographical Island Flexibility. And it is about the flexibility of the demand and the consumption. So including involving prosumers, asking citizens uh, their will to, to change their lifestyle also for changing the, the, the hours of their consumption when it's possible. So real application is the, the next steps. And uh, of course, it can be something that we can also discuss together. Davide, there is a question from you, from remote, from Sergei Levchenko. Is there a difference between the results of your analysis and the existing official information? Uh, the difference between the results and the existing official information. Yeah, the difference sometimes is with setup. The 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 the. Yes. The difference is uh, sometimes is uh, uh, in the in some previous estimation uh, that we have found in some islands, for example, that were too much approximated. So their estimation were not so detailed. So there were a difference because if you mm, apply. A, um, if you carry out a research in an area, you can, you can get different, uh, different data according with the methodology you use. But, uh, but I think it's only a matter of uh, um, higher uh, focus on, on a real application. So as much elements I will consider as much detailed uh, results I can obtain. So this is more or less the um, what we have seen uh, considering the difference. In some cases, yes, there were some also significant difference. In other cases, no. It depends on, on the previous data we, we analyze and were available for the uh, local, um, local institutions. Thank you. Okay, so I think I can... Uh, we can uh, skip to Claudia Meloni. Um, Claudia Meloni will present uh, um, the uh, Enea point of view on PED. Uh, actually, um, we have uh, an extensive uh, research ongoing from several years. So for this uh, meeting, we have prepared um, um, a, a short presentation highlighting uh, which uh, contribution Enea can provide in the direction of PET. Claudia, I think you are online. Uh, so I'm Claudia Meloni, I'm a researcher in Enea. And um, uh, today I want to speak uh, about uh, um, a project that uh, is mentioned the by Beatrice uh, before, that is uh, the project technologies for efficient penetration of the electric carrier into the, the end user. Um, I am the responsible 
responsible of this project and of the uh, work package local energy district. Uh, uh, this program um, is uh, about uh, the electric system uh, research uh, and uh, is a, a, an important uh, uh, program financed by a, a national uh, um, minister of the um, economic development. development. And this program um, goes to um, uh, innovating uh, the national electric system, uh, decreasing uh, the electric power cost for uh, the end user. The end user is uh, the, the focus of the, the whole program. And also uh, enhancing the system reliability and the service quality. And uh, uh, finally, uh, allowing the user uh, to, to use energy sources uh, uh, in, a rational, in a rational way. Uh, in particular, uh, um, our division, uh, Smart Energy, of the Department of um, Energy Technologies in ENEA, uh, is involved in uh, this project and uh, in particular in the work package Local Energy District that uh, is uh, strictly connected with the PED issue. Uh, in fact, this uh, work, uh, work package uh, is focused on the developing of an integrated model of uh, smart district um, uh, that combines uh, um, technological and social aspect and improves uh, um, the service for the, the citizen in terms of energy consumption and fun functionalities. The next, please, Paola. Ah, another aspect, sorry, sorry, Paola. Another aspect is that the, the program is divided in, in two, uh, divided in two parts. One is dedicated uh, to the product, to the developing of products and process technologies for the energy transition. And the other part that is the, the majority is dedicated to technologies, the system and the organizational and management models for the energy transition. So we have two, two parts that are strictly connected within them. Next, please. Next slide. I have on my screen. Uh, just one moment. Okay. okay, we can see. In this table, um, this table is the, the, the topic of today. We want to show how our research on, on this uh, local energy district is strictly connected with the um, PEDS issue. And uh, in fact, uh, um, in this table, we can see uh, in the green uh, box uh, um, how our methodologies and approach of research and the uh, related output are uh, um, connect in connection with uh, some uh, important elements of um, PED issues. Uh, like uh, strategies for uh, PED energy, uh, the urban resilience, uh, the integration strategies, uh, and the tackling uh, affordability of the house. So uh, this, uh, uh, the goal of the, this um, work package is uh, um, really um, uh, in, uh, in the relationship with uh, uh, the, the PED issues. I can see the presentation anymore, but... Eh, no, nulla, non ho fatto niente. È, è, partita, è partita la presentazione, ragazzi. Qua siamo messi male. Un attimo. Eh. Yes. Sì, sì. Dopo un po' salta. Ok, posso passare alla slide dopo? Yes, thank you. Now, in uh, briefly, I can, I want to uh, 
give you some information about uh, some uh, uh, tasks that we are uh, carrying out in, uh, in this uh, work package. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first uh, is um, the first uh, set of tasks are um, dedicated to the the buildings uh, uh, sector, and uh, they are uh, strictly connected with the governance path for people and the tackling affordability for houses and fighting energy poverty. And um, this uh, uh, task uh, um, concern about uh, a replicable uh, smart home model uh, capable of uh, monitoring energy consumption, comfort and safety in residential building. Uh, so uh, the, the user are uh, uh, residential that uh, in which uh, um, houses uh, are um, there are um, uh, a lot of sensors uh, like uh, for monitoring, for electricity monitoring, thermal monitoring presence, and uh, for manage the, the comfort. And um, these uh, sensors uh, gave some data uh, to a higher level that is uh, um, an app, uh, a platform, Domus. Uh, where uh, these data are um, uh, collected and uh, aggregated to provide uh, um, um, a range of uh, feedback for the, the user uh, uh, to improve uh, their en energy behavior. And uh, next. It's coming, it's a bit slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Here we can see a detail of uh, the, um, the platform uh, named the Domus, that is a, a web app uh, available for all the uh, users that uh, are linked with uh, this uh, INEA platform. And we are we are we have the two kinds of user: the generic user, uh, and um, with the um, the um, smart meter of the second generation. We so is uh, um, we can collect data from the general electric consumption, and uh, the other uh, specific user is. Uh, smart home user uh, and um, we can collect the data from all the sensor that we have uh, seen in the previous uh, slide. Uh, these data are collected uh, in the, the Domus app and uh, also uh, some uh, um, relevant uh, uh, stakeholder can uh, um, have um, a view of this uh, data because there is uh, uh, available uh, for the management uh, for the manager of uh, the, the whole system uh, like um, aggregator uh, DSO and um, at a district level so is a uh, um, uh, a framework of um, um, data uh, and uh, um, database that are available at different uh, level. Uh, next. Yes, it's coming. Another, no, is it not, not yet. Okay, available. Uh, another task, yes. Another task is um, uh, also related to tackling affordability of houses and fighting energy poverty. Is um, focused on uh, smart second generation uh, sector. Uh, in this activity, um, smart buildings are. Um, uh, dedicate uh, are uh, focused on um, energy independence and flexibility, and uh, these buildings are equipped uh, with um, an advanced control system uh, that allow to storage energy 
and in uh, and a dynamic uh, pricing and automatic demand response uh, scenarios. Uh, it is possible to integrate uh, production, management and storage uh, by renewable sources. Um, and we use, uh, of course, uh, uh, photovoltaic system uh, because of uh, um, the program is uh, about the electric uh, system uh, research. Uh, the next. Another uh, um, specific uh, task dedicated to the, the building uh, is a um, smart social building. And it is a, a particular very interesting uh, activity because uh, um, here buildings are divided in modularity and thematic areas from a social point of view. So we have uh, uh, specific modules dedicated to low high society uh, people, uh, human frailty or students. So we can uh, uh, dedicate a specific area and uh, dimension and uh, functionality uh, to different uh, users that uh, have uh, different needs. Uh, so uh, the dimension and the, the functionality of these modules are different by the different uh, um, kind of uh, of the user, and in these uh, figures we can see how they can be assembled in uh, the entire uh, in the entire building. They are uh, the uh, an interesting uh, developing for um, social building, residential building. The next, please. Uh, this is a, a, a highlight topic because uh, recently INEA um, began to carry out uh, an important uh, research activity on energy community but um, uh, not only by an energetic point of view but uh, um, INEA want to uh, boost to improve the creation and the uh, develop development of energy community in Italy um, um, by um, uh, an important uh, innovative model uh, based on aggregated uh, services, enabling, enabling technologies uh, also uh, with smart contract and blockchain and innovative tools uh, uh, um, that uh, can uh, remunerate uh, the flexibility and uh, promote uh, the virtuous uh, behavior by an energetic point of view. So we have an um, um, uh, ICT platform, uh, a framework um, with a platform and uh, a lot of uh, tools uh, by which uh, it's possible to uh, evaluate uh, the feasibility, uh, the technical and economic, uh, economical feasibility um, to the, for the setup of a new uh, energy community. And also uh, it is possible to manage uh, and evaluate the performance uh, of uh, an energy community uh, for uh, um, his manager. Uh, another important aspect is that uh, we have a, a local token economy in, the, in this framework, uh, in which it's possible to exchange uh, goods and services uh, or, um, uh, by neighborhood um, that are remunerated by token, energy token and uh, social, uh, social token. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, now um, uh, I want to give some information uh, uh, um, with some tasks uh, related uh, to um, the platform that uh, can manage data uh, from the, the city and from the energy intensive infrastructure. Uh, this uh, uh, platform, uh, named the Smart City Platform, 
is a, um, a framework in which a central platform on a national scale uh, can collect uh, urban data in the field of the smart city. So we have the data from uh, public building, uh, public lighting, uh, mobility, tourism, uh, air quality, environment, uh, and so on. Um, and um, uh, to give some uh, specific uh, KPI and benchmark. Uh, useful for the for the best uh, management of a uh, smart city. So we have a specific uh, smart city platform dedicated to a specific city, and uh, a superior, le a higher level uh, at a national level, uh, in which we can compare uh, a smart city with another city. And uh, you can uh, also see uh, how this um, framework. Uh, uh, works uh, in uh, in um, a smart city platform dot uh, nea dot uh, it and um, we can follow yes another uh, um, framework that is a, a city platform named the public energy living lab um, is uh, dedicated uh, to the uh, energy intensive uh, infrastructure at a national level not only uh, urban level. Uh, Pel pe um, uh, goals um, is uh, the monitoring and the evaluation of the performance of energy lighting buildings or also water and waste grid and so on. And uh, uh, the activity is uh, um, developed uh, with the collaboration of an important uh, national institution like uh, CONCIP and, uh, and like uh, the National uh, Agency for uh, Digital Italy. In, in fact, uh, PEL is adopted by CONCIP for uh, uh, Luce for call for tenders. Uh, and is uh, compliant with the agile guide, guidelines uh, for the digital uh, issue. Uh, you can see how PEL uh, works uh, on the dedicated website. Uh, the next. Um, uh, to, to govern a city is important uh, 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 to consider it uh, not only an energetic uh, and uh, um, sustainable aspect, uh, ma all, but also uh, safe, safe, uh, um, safe aspect, uh, safety, safety aspect for sustainable cities. Uh, uh, so, uh, for INEA, the resilience is uh, also important as the energy aspect. And uh, we um, carry out uh, an important uh, research uh, to set up a framework that is a, a solution to prevent advanced uh, events by now casting uh, in a scenario in urban area uh, with a specific uh, focus on uh, blackout and uh, communication blackout that are uh, strictly uh, linked by the electrical uh, issue. And also this activity is developed uh, uh, with the national, uh, the, it has adopted also from, uh, from them. Uh, the last activity I want to speak about is uh, uh, the small roads that are uh, so the perhaps the our future uh, to use uh, the the mobility infrastructure uh, because uh, is um, we can consider the the vehicle that is on almost the electric vehicle that can move uh, along uh, the city and uh, uh, collect some data from uh, smart poles uh, and, and change uh, this data with a uh, higher level uh, platform uh, to, um, to for the mobility management 
and for uh, the, um, the, the, the safety of the, the mobility se service. And uh, this is a new activity, so we are confident that uh, in the next year we can uh, um, give you some more uh, results about, about it. And uh, for today is, uh, is enough, is a, a briefly presentation of our uh, uh, activity in this, um, in this um, field. Thank you for, for the, the attention. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Claudia, is there any question for Claudia Meloni concerning some aspect of the presentation? We check from remote if someone no, apparently no. So thank you very much for your presentation, Claudia. You're welcome. Thank you. And we can move to the last part of the morning. Program. Yeah, <laughs> Th thank you. Uh, now we, we are back to session three, center the topic, ongoing practices looking for gaps. We will have different uh, contribution. We will start with Caroline Chang uh, from Sintef, uh, and she will be opening up this session, actually providing um, a comprehensive uh, view on what's forgotten about stakeholder management in PEDS. So I will ask uh, uh, Caroline if she can uh, share her screen. Otherwise, I can do for her the same. Please, Caroline. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm very happy to um, join you online today from uh, Trondheim, Norway. Uh, my name is uh, Caroline Chang, and I'm a research scientist uh, from Sintef in Norway. Um, yeah, in, in my work at Sintef, I'm involved in the planning and innovation management of um, pet technologies and solutions in national projects and, also, and demos in Norway and also in uh, EU projects. Um, I'm very pleased today to be invited to be part of this session. And today I would like to share with you some of my thoughts uh, about the important, uh, important topic of uh, stakeholder engagement in pets, but focusing on what has been neglected about stakeholder engagement in pets. Um, Okay, I hope you uh, see a slight shift, yeah? Good. Um, and in, that, in addition, I would also like to pinpoint a gap I see in the so-called notion of a pet toolbox. So therefore, um, this presentation has been entitled What Has Been Neglected About Stakeholder Engagement in Pets? Closing in on a gap in the pet toolbox. <clears throat> Um, yes, so the point of uh, departure of my talk, uh, we all acknowledge that the success of implementing the pioneering concept of pets will not only depend on adapting technical solutions, but also on mobilizing social, political and business commitments. Um, that it is through collective innovation that more and more districts and neighborhoods can achieve the ambition of pets. We have also come to regard every pet as a complex process that requires a high degree of coordination due to the multi-stakeholder environment. The setup of every pet will always involve multiple building blocks and a large number of stakeholders and, and contribut contributors, which will each have their own ambitions, um, agendas, interests, and constraints. We have been made increasingly aware that stakeholders tend to shift their positions and rethink their involvement when moving from one phase of pet development to another. So the work of stakeholder engagement and implementation of pets is absolutely important and a very difficult task. But it seems that some important aspects have been neglected. Could this uh, constitute a gap that could decelerate the transition towards sustainable urban areas, as is the theme of this webinar? Are we uh, letting opportunities to achieve more pets slip away? 
I would like to invite you to join me to look at um, three aspects that I think we have uh, neglected or underprioritized. <clears throat> so first, what has been neglected is that stakeholder is a concept that can be defined in a wide or narrow sense. It seems that stakeholders in PET are often depicted in a broad sense, at least in the projects that I have been involved in. To shine light on this, we can look to relevant stakeholder literature within strategic management. The field of strategic management um, is my background, and it is fertile ground as uh, stakeholder analysis is a widely discussed theme in there. Stakeholder is a concept that can be defined in a narrow and a wide sense. In a wide sense, a stakeholder is any group um, who can affect the achievement of a firm's objectives or who is affected by the achievement of a firm's objectives. But in a narrow sense, a stakeholder is any identifiable group or individual on which the project is dependent for, for its continued survival. At this end of the spectrum, instead of a faceless entity, stakeholders can be interpreted as full-faced actors in that they can affect or are affected by the development of the pet. In other words, stakeholders are actors who act and react in the process, which is interactive, evolutionary, and responsive. Whether they are municipalities, real estate developers, building owners, energy providers, ICT companies, or citizens. Given the importance of stakeholder engagement in the planning and implementation of pets, there is room to zoom in on the concept of stakeholder in a narrow sense and to consider more actor-oriented stakeholder approaches in pet developments. <clears throat> so while holding on um, to the previous thought, I would like to further add on another aspect that seems to have been neglected. Um, as, a thema as a thematic topic in strategic management literature, Stakeholder processes are uh, understood to typically involve four aspects, the who, the why, the what, and the how. In the context of pet development, the first is the question of who. Who are the potential counterparts with whom the owner or driver of that pet face must involve and engage? Then the second aspect is the question of why. Why do parties need to engage with one another uh, with each other or one another. Here the ambitions, agendas, and interests come to the fore. The third aspect is the question of what. What type of influences determine the involvement or engagement? Here the willingness to act uh, or other constraints will need to be considered. And then finally, um, which is what is most talked about, the fourth aspect is the question of how. How can the involvement or engagement be structured and organized to let them function in the manner intended? As you can see, the first step towards robust stakeholder engagement uh, is to tackle the who aspect systematically. In other words, before considering how the work of stakeholder uh, engagement can be structured and organized, the stakeholders will need to be systematically identified first. Yet we tend to ne neglect that uh, this first step towards robust stakeholder engagement strategy is to, is to tackle this um, who aspect. <clears throat> the development of pets is arguably the development of an innovation embedded in a community of organizations and individuals, be it occupants, inhabitants, and citizens who can affect or are affected by the innovation. Like all innovation, it can be expected to be a very, very messy process. So a systematic approach would pay off because stakeholder engagement is a very intensive um, exercise and it's very expensive. It is necessary to work towards a strategic list of stakeholders to engage. And furthermore, on the ground, um, in, praxis, in, in, in praxis, there are often tricky strategy tensions between competitors and co uh, between competition and cooperation. 
on whether firms should develop long-term collaborative relationships with other firms or should remain essentially independent. These are the realities confronted by pet owners and drivers looking to foster long-lasting commitment for collaboration and coordination in their multi-stakeholder environment. Because the task is difficult, there seems to be lots of room for pet research and practitioners to make use of a stakeholder mapping tool to tackle the who aspect to help navigate the multi-stakeholder environment of every pet. It also seems that there's room to establish a more systematic approach to the first, towards this first aspect of stakeholder mapping, defining the stakeholder in a more narrow sense that is an, an actor-oriented approach towards stakeholder mapping. And now we'll um, take a little um, so-called short detour as we before we get to the third neglected, neglected aspect. Um, so the little detour is um, I'd like to share with you um, what provoked a recent paper um, that I did in collaboration with researchers in both Annex 83 and Cost Action. And this paper considers it necessary to get this first aspect of the stakeholder process done well, to be in a good position to keep in view the diverse um, ambitions, agendas, interests, and constraints of stakeholders. The paper asked this uh, question, how can stakeholders be systematically mapped in the different phases of pet development? So uh, besides uh, defining stakeholders in a narrow sense and focusing on the who aspect of the stakeholder process, it also considers the phases of uh, pet development. The levels of uh, granularity uh, are still subject to research and discussion, of course. Um, phases of pet development would be dependent on whether the project is a new build or a refurbishment, retrofit, and other factors. But a starting point could be looking at the phases in pet development shown here, uh, including steps like master planning, energy planning, construction, refurbishment planning, and of course, implementing implementation and then the mon uh, operation phase, and as well as the monitoring and post-occupancy evaluation. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm not gonna go into details at all, but the, pap the paper suggests that a systematic approach towards identifying the type of stakeholders in pet developments, start with a better understanding of the interaction of the owner and driver of the pet and the entities in the network context. So uh, the paper then puts forth a simple tool to facilitate a systematic analysis of the web of relational actors uh, by categorizing these actors, um, these major groups of external actors with whom the owner or driver of the pet can or must interact. Among these eight uh, major groups of actors, a distinction can be made between the industry actors and the contextual actors. Industry actors are basically those entities that perform value adding uh, activities or consume the outputs of the activities. While contextual actors are those entities who be whose behavior, intentionally or not, sets the conditions under which the industry actors must act and operate. So the figure here shows the industry actors in blue, uh, such as suppliers and buyers. Um, be it citizen, occupants, or inhabitants, and the industry outsiders and insiders, and the contextual actors in yellow, the economic, economical, technological, re political, regulatory, and the socio-cultural actors. Defining um, stakeholders in the narrow sense, this tool helps to delineate, delineate these eight categories of actors to prepare for a more actor-oriented approach in the next steps of the stakeholder processes. <clears throat> um, the next slide just quickly shows you um, what was done in the paper. The paper goes on to apply the tool in various pet cases, uh, which are in different phases and also in different national contexts, um, but I will not elaborate on them here. So the development of um, um, what I'm getting to is that the development of an actor-oriented uh, stakeholder mapping tool with the eight categories of actors 
Uh, that is attuned to the phases of the PET process and also different scale of stakeholders, such as building level, um, neighborhood level or district level and the city level, connects to the bigger picture of um, um, developing managerial tools for pets. Um, what are managerial tools? Managerial tools are a special category of tools. Um, a managerial tool is not objective. It makes an argument about what is important to analyze strategically. And at the same time, it is also um, making an argument on what is not um, uh, uh, strategic to analyze. Um, in the example of the stakeholder mapping tool I've just shared, the tool is expected to be helpful in identifying the type of stakeholders to prioritize and to engage and also for shaping up a dialogue of understanding pets as a process. Um, the tool may be use, a useful starting point for practitioners who feel a need for mapping out pet stakeholders systematically before meetings and workshops, for example. <clears throat> so then I get to here, which is um, the third aspect that has been neglected. So, in terms of the bigger picture, what I uh, want to add here is that um, what uh, seems to have been underprioritized is that the notion of um, the pet toolbox comprises not only technical tools and um, governance tools, but can also include a category of managerial tools that merit attention in its own right. And the stakeholder mapping tool I've just mentioned is just one example of a managerial tool that can be helpful. Um, in fact, pet, pet, I would argue that pet, pet practitioners need a variety of uh, managerial tools to provide different perspectives and peripher peripheral vision to guide the thinking process. Tools, um, um, managerial tools can help to create shared understandings, languages and procedures. Uh, managerial tools can also help practitioners see better to get, gather information better. Uh, interact more fluidly to name a few. So um, this is one of the gaps. There's room to extend the notion of the pet toolbox to include managerial tools. Um, in fact, addressing managerial tools for pets is an exciting uh, research avenue that we are getting started uh, with at Sintef in our ongoing projects and uh, demos. Um, more tools from strategic management literature can uh, definitely be consulted. Uh, uh, ongoing studies then can place the empirical um, point of observation closer to the practitioner. And this will further open up the research agenda in developing and uh, critiquing useful managerial tools for pet developments. <clears throat> yes, so um, that's uh, what I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, for this very inspiring presentation. I would suggest to carry on uh, uh, with the cities and maybe come back to uh, everybody's uh, for the comments uh, later on. So I have the pleasure to invite because he is finally here with us, not, notwithstanding the volcano's activity recently putting uh, some risk uh, uh, to his own uh, travel. Joao Dinis from the municipality of Cascais. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very kind and lovely invitation to be here in this beautiful city of Rome. I'm very happy to be here, so grazie mille. <laughs> so starting firstly, let me talk to you about Cascais just briefly. We are a nearly 100 square kilometer municipality on the outskirts of the Lisbon metropolitan region. And we are located between the mountains and the ocean. So it's a very special place. Therefore, almost one third of our area is protected landscape. Because of that, we are a very renowned tourist destination and we have a lot of cultural and natural heritage. But we also have been facing some climate related hazards. They have been more intense so and also more frequent. So one of our many challenges that we're facing now. So what are we doing about this? We've been working very hard for the past 10 years 
We were one of the few and first uh, municipalities to do a strategic plan for climate change at the local level, which later on uh, had an, um, a positive feedback from our partners, from all the stakeholders, and we developed the climate change adaptation action plan, which means now that we have a wide set of actions that we have to implement within the scope of the SDGs, so until 2030. And uh, also because of that, we've developed the SDGs 2030 that help us to have you know, a more integrated approach in all of this. And just this year, we finally approved on a on municipal assembly, the carbon neutrality route 2050 for our city. So not only do we have the national goal, but now we defined our own local goal and we've started to act. So we have a lot of uh, initiatives already there uh, implemented. I would say that more or less 53 to 55% of all those actions that I've mentioned before are already implemented, but mostly on adaptation. Now we are talking about mitigation and uh, P, uh, positive energy districts. So that's another challenge, which brings me to the carbon neutrality goals that we have. So the first of all is that if you look at the top graphic, you'll understand that we have more or less the same energy matrix that anyone here, which is transportation, about half of the emissions, and then domestic and services, the other half. Our industry is not that relevant, but remember, we do have a um, uh, urban and service-based municipality. <laughs> so we, we consider this as a quite a, a need for a, a strategic planning, and it does envision something that is different. So it's a, sh a, sh a complete shift with our societal organization, and we do have to meet this ambition with uh, innovation. So a few of our, my colleagues that have been working on mobility have been developing the Mobi Kashkaish program. So very interestingly, we merged different stakeholders that were never merged together. We merged a new technology, not only let's call it high-end technology, but also apps. So technology that is affordable and available for the general public, that's the key for success. So now we, you, we have a, like a, a one-stop shop on your phone where you can get all your um, uh, mobility needs, uh, bus, uh, which is free by the way, uh, you can get a uh, train, rent your bicycle, charge your EV car on or park your car just from that. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a service that we consider that is a, an incentive for you to leave your car behind. We've also been um, talking with citizens. So if we increase, we consider that if we increase the early adopters with, for example, test pilots, we understand that the mouth to mouth will kind of work and we'll have more questions in the future. This is something that we will uh, obviously consider. And the way that we engage with that is like I mentioned before with incentives. So if we have an incentive for the general public, they will come. We cannot change that for changing, for the sake of changing. We've had a very interesting review that it, it's on the debate right now. We had elections, municipal elections last weekend. And uh, one of the mayors that had made the biggest bet on mobility transition, so uh, promoting bicycles, they even have funds for bicycles. If you want to buy a bike, you'll get an, an incentive, a fiscal incentive for that. It's quite innovative, but they lost. And apparently not a lot of people made this because it wasn't seen as an incentive. It was something that was against the status quo. And I think that's why they failed. So that's why we're kind of changing this. Um, we also need to have these tangible results. So environmental, because people are very demanding on that, which is excellent, but also financial, which they have to see, this is good for me, right? This is something that we, we, we have to consider. And finally, if we have a participatory process, like was mentioned in the previous presentation, well, we'll engage everyone on this and we'll be working together. So why do we need to work together? Because if you look at this graphics, this is quite a challenge. We need to reduce uh, over 500 kilotons of CO2 uh, every year to meet our carbon neutrality goals in, uh, in just a couple of decades. So it's just quite, quite significant effort. We are doing this on four uh, main uh, drivers, which is stationary energy, transportation, water and waste, and forest and soil use. This last one is obviously working as a carbon sink. Remember, one third of our protected landscape is there. We're promoting it, so hopefully it will help out and do its, its own well. Uh, but we also need to reduce water consumption 
and waste production. It doesn't necessarily depend on us, right? So if we're talking about positive energy districts, we have to consider waste. I'm sorry, but it's quite a task. If we produce a computer, if we produce handbags, clothes, or water bottles, we, make sure, we need to make sure that it's a circular economy and we need to consider the emission rate on that positive energy trans um, issue. Transportation, like I mentioned before, and stationary energy. So one of this, the stationary energy that we're uh, acting is, for example, we need to do solar communities worth 185 megawatts of production. It's a lot, isn't it? Um, we need to, to finalize or end regulation of gas installation in new housings. We need to stop that and we need to put solar and heat pumps because Portugal is a very sunny day, a sunny country. And in a sunny day, you, you have more than, than you need, obviously. And uh, which is interesting having this conversation today because as you know, the prices of energy in Europe are floating because of this. <laughs> so, uh, and we also, once again, the word is incentives. We need to, to, to have um, uh, a lot of, uh, of thermal energy. And uh, in the mind afternoon presentation from tomorrow, we'll actually go deeper into this. So what we can do is actually, for example, working together with other European projects, such as the European City Facility, which is helping out to work out this last one, the Solar Communities Program. So uh, what we want to do is to develop one or more energy communities. The, our goal is to develop one, which is worth 184 megawatts. We need to do, and we are currently ending a market analysis. Who's on here? Who's not? A one-stop shop. Like I said, I'm a citizen. I don't know nothing about this. I know I have a roof and tiles and how much can I produce? How much do I use? And this is the type of language that we need to use. We need to also assess and a benchmark. So this network and you as professionals and scientists are extremely important for us because we need to translate how to, can we do this. Um, and obviously, assess how much are we saving on energy consumption and CO2 emissions. So if we have this, we'll have also the project implementation guidelines, which is great because we then can replicate this to any municipality that has the same legal, <laughs> legal, which is a quite, the biggest challenge that we have, the legal challenges and the technology channels. So we, this is what we aim for, to produce. Obviously, we're working on pilot projects. We want to produce 230 gigawatts year on renewable energy sources. Uh, we will have a lot of CO2 uh, tons estimated. And uh, we want to make sure that we have this with a little bit more intangible action. So calling citizens, calling stakeholders, uh, calling market um, um, providers, so service providers or technology providers to make sure that we have this really interesting bond. Um, which is basically that what I just uh, added, but we do need to have a bit of a more um, financial aspect of this. So if we are able to define our energy community um, in a more broadened sense of, of uh, how shall I say this, in um, this is what you are putting and investing, and this is what you will take out in the future. This is actually crucial because families need to assess what are the gains for them. And because this, uh, once again, I'll use the word, the status quo is so different from this line of thinking. It's so centralized in profit making and a security of, of, um, of giving out energy for our needs so we don't have the problems that we're facing currently. Uh, this is a shift and this is, it's, it's a significant shift. And that's why in Portugal, this law came out in 2019. And just very recently, one of our partners has made it possible in a very small municipality of North it's a it's a fairly new thing, but it's it's not at this scale. It's not hundred. Uh, it's not reaching out megawatts, and we need to make sure because that's the only way that we can shift towards carbon neutrality. Um, this is our pilot project. So this is the Nova University, and uh, I'll speak again of it. I'll use the exact same image, image in tomorrow's presentation. Uh, but basically, we're putting uh, five hundred kilowatts on this rooftops, and we are going to talk to the neighborhood area. And why the neighborhood area? Because technically you need a distribution point, right? And they have a distribution point there. So we cannot go above it. So that's one of the legal slash technical hurdles that we need to surpass. But still 500 kilowatts, it's more than enough for a lot of families that will be there. And we'll be sure, interestingly, that this is a school. So they will use the energy on weekdays and in the weekends, families will benefit from it. 
So it, it's, it's the type of, of line of thinking that we need to consider. We also do the exact same power in our facilities. So we have operational facilities. This is actually a very, a not very sunny day that we have there, but that's actually my office over there. Uh, and we need to implement 500 kilowatts and which is exactly the same line of thinking. We're going to use it during the weekdays and during the weekends, we can sort of give it up to the houses or the neighboring areas. So we've made the assessment that we have rooftop of 60 hectares. So that's a lot of megawatts as well. And we also want to make sure that we centralize production because if we do it, it's easier for households to be part of an energy community like ours. They just need to buy the energy. So we'll, they will be part of it. They will be shareholders. They will be stakeholders and they will just buy because that's what they want. And interestingly, when you talk to normal citizens at a bus, not at a bus stop, but imagine if you have this conversation at a bus stop, the amount of people that say, well, I'm actually interesting on that because of the environmental impact, not on financial, is surprisingly high, which that gives us obviously a lot of motivation. And it does give us motivation to have all the stakeholders. For example, that's a hydrogen powered bus. It's the first uh, in Portugal working with uh, in a real world um, example. We have two of them and we have this charging point at our office as well. And it has been having excellent reviews. So now we're hoping to make the above mentioned one so we can power this. So it's called the green hydrogen, as you know, and that's actually the solution because a lot of people are questioning hydrogen, which is obviously okay to, to question. So uh, just to, to finalize, projects must be included in structured action. So this is why when I talk about pilot projects, when I talk about a broader sense of, of uh, investments, we also talk about the carbon neutrality plan. This is structured actions. We also need to consider replication. If I do something successful, the other 307 municipalities in Portugal can also do it. So I hope to, to succeed on that and to leverage that. And uh, well, carbon neutrality is a challenge for everyone. So private investor, companies, cities, uh, scientists, uh, families all together, we will surely have this uh, change in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joao, for this, again, very interesting presentation. Yes, excellent. Uh, let me thank uh, David again, because David was also our first guest during the webinar we offered a few weeks ago. And so thank you again, uh, David, and uh, thank you for your presentation. The floor is yours. Hopefully you can hear me and you can see the presentation. Very well. Thanks a lot. Uh, from my side, <clears throat> also uh, greetings from the Kladno, Czech Republic. And thank you for inviting me. And hopefully the presentation will, uh, will work uh, properly. Let's continue. Uh, here uh, you, might, you might see just a distance taste of the city. So, uh, sorry, sorry, David, to, yeah. to catch you, but maybe you can share in full screen okay, mode, okay. please. Uh, here we go. Let's try it. Is it better? Perfect. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, Kladna City is uh, around uh, 70,000. Uh, population area double times when it comes to agglomeration. It's not that big in comparison with other cities in the Euro, but in the Czech, Czech perspective is quite quite large. Uh, even there is one specific uh, specific situation or element that we are not that far from the Prague. So basically we are part of the agglomeration of the capital city. Um, we are also the urban center for uh, the surrounding cities, so that means that we are uh, we are offering and we have to operate uh, lots of public services, and we are also the transport hub, since Prague is not that far away and is the biggest employer in the region, so lots of, let's say, uh, movements, flows, and every every mobility and, and this kind of stuff is uh, is happening in the city. We also struggling as as Czech Republic as general population population aging, so there is a pressure on social systems uh, and and other services like that. And we are well known uh, for for the heavy industry uh, background, which you might still see in the city. And also some of the areas are potential for uh, let's say improvement or realization of some projects since. 
some of them are still brownfields and we have to also re solve this kind of uh, issues. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, won't, I won't speak about the uh, projects or interventions we have realized. Uh, mostly I will talk about the current situation and the future one. And uh, thanks to the Sparks, uh, which, is, uh, which is the International Horizon funded project, uh, where we are uh, with the Espo, Lyspig, Maya, Kifisi, Arakia, Lviv and other partners uh, to be involved. And we are the fellow cities. And I would be um, not that far away from the, from the truth if I, if I say that this project just has started kind of new, new decade, new transformation of the city, not only in, in, in terms of, of energy or climate. Uh, I will be touch upon this also the next slides, but there is a crucial partner. It's a technical university and a center for energy efficiency in the buildings. And Michal is there with you, so he can anytime uh, add any information uh, to this because we are very intensive working collaboration system to get, together with the university. Uh, after one year, we have developed the uh, overall strategy. Uh, which is a uh, well-known SECAP, Action Plan for Climate and, and Energy. And this is, I mean, like the first key message from my side, doing lots of stuff and measures and projects, initiative, without knowing uh, exactly what the city uh, is in and what, what city should focus on in the future is very difficult. So we have decided to create this overall city strategy, not only dealing with energy, but dealing also with mobility, industry, housing uh, sector, and so on and so on, would be very difficult to do anything. Uh, so now, uh, if we create any project, if we think about structural investment in the city, we are all the time uh, putting this in line with the overall strategy. How many, you know, uh, how many CO2 emissions we will decrease, how many energy savings we will produce within the project and so on and so on. And there are several, several uh, let's say, data and indicators we will in the future uh, control and, and monitor in this sense. We have also created the financial strategy behind that. So it's kind of obvious, obvious that the, um, our goal will be very difficult and harsh since only like 10 or 10, 15% is directly, directly influenced by the city and the rest it lies in the hand of the private housing and other partners hands. So this is gonna be a very difficult task for us to also moderate, to, to provide some incentives, to provide some consultation information, that kind of stuff. And strategy is very, very important for us. Now we know almost everything. And of course, these informations are sometimes scary, but we know the situation in the city. Um, we have also built a partnership around the uh, overall strategy and future projects. Now we are in the stage that we are elaborating the around 30 project outlines. Some of them are already in under realization. Some of them will be realized in the future. And since the beginning, we have created energy platform and we are running one-to-one -one regular meetings with the partners. Since we are not a big city, uh, we can afford to, uh, you know, uh, pay attention to some meetings and, you know, uh, spend some time with partners. Uh, and this is very, very important as well. And we try to run it since beginning. Uh, here you might see the five strategic pillars, uh, just a taste of the, our project guidelines we are preparing or we are in partially. And of course, uh, we try to uh, have the also the positive energy district the projects, which is the, the yellow, yellow color text um, on the, the right side. So this is only like the example of the projects we would like to implement in the future. And as I was mentioning, some of them are already under realization. Positive energy district in the in the cloud now. Together with uh, Technical University, we have developed kind of very, you know, uh, short and clear uh, leaflet, what the PET means, uh, very generic uh, information for, uh, let's say, target groups. Uh, so the concept uh, is described there and it's quite clear. Of course, the rest is very difficult, but let's, let's, uh, let's uh, continue. 
And we have somehow decided that the positive energy district is very complex and vertically and horizontally interconnected with almost everything we do in the city. Since we can take lots of learnings from the uh, preparation and we take it as a uh, part of the vision of the city, which is also the task in the sparks is uh, one of the strategic pillar. It's uh, all, in the same time, it's a vertical project outline and it also it's a test bed for the vision road mapping we run in Sparks. And for future, we would like to have it as a test bed for the future demo site. And together with Kashkai, uh, as, as you saw the presentation, we have tried to uh, get some funding from another Horizon project, Urban Chameleon. We haven't succeeded so far, but hopefully in the future, we will uh, we will succeed with some kind of uh, demo sites and some particular projects. Uh, hopefully, also com combining not only the soft uh, money for the preparation, but also some investment money. Uh, selection. We uh, again uh, and all, all, almost all the things were around with the uh, uh, university with uh, with Michal and his team. We did the citywide analysis, uh, not looking only on the energy side, but looking and checking also uh, urban context, socio-economic context, since the city is still competing with or dealing with uh, historical problems. And we have lots of social, uh, weak social layers here. So we don't have to leave behind any of these kind of groups. So we have to deal with this as well. We have checked the ownership structure. This is very difficult task in the city since the, the city has sold lots of uh, development areas in the 90s, but still we have something so we, have, we can use it. And then we did some initial uh, consideration of technological opportunities. So with uh, having in our mind that uh, there is a priority of keeping heating system in the city uh, close to the heating central system, uh, we would like to choose the, the variety of composition of buildings, but there has to be huge potential for renewables. With uh, these priorities, we have selected two localities. One is uh, uh, most uh, or the biggest candidate, which is the positive energy of Sletiště around the sports area. And let's skip into this. And uh, this is the like uh, map of this area is quite big, and of course the boundaries. Uh, physical and, and the virtual in terms of energy schemes could be uh, a bit change in the future, but this is the state, state of play. And in it, you might find the sports area, hospital complex, retirement house, residential houses. So you see that there are lots of lots of different different housing and infrastructure uh, uh, spots. Uh, here you might see the objectives, but I suppose those are more general for most of the paths. So you can you can read it after all afterwards. Here uh, components of the our positive energy district in Kladno from the design part to the operational part. So you might see that. Okay, the, on, on, uh... Another noise, sorry. Perché sì. con il tuo rettore, come si eh, chiama? Ricordamelo. No? I apologize, David, sì. we are solving the problem. Please, the participant, eh, close the microphone. Gli puoi chiedere? This is Giuseppe. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please, David, sorry about that. Good signal to be shorter. So let's keep this, this slide and <laughs> I'll carry, uh, carry on with another one. Uh, yeah. This is like the first energy schemes we have. We have designed, uh, actually university did for us and we are discussing this. Uh, of course, we have to, we have to uh, combine lots of factors there and approaches since the locality is not homo homogenic, you know, uh, both consumption, production and storage we have to solve. And also we are solving the renovation of the current infrastructure and there are lots of plans for uh, constructing new new infrastructure. So we have to somehow combine lots of approaches there. And that, that's for sure the locality won't be able to provide one unique energy solution, but it has to be, it has to be the combination of lots of approaches, both on the production and, and consumption side. Uh, there are activities which we done. There's also working group there. And since we want to, to, to have a look, um, want to proceed with a kind of strategic framing uh, look, 
on it, uh, we we are about to create also some urban concept for the area, which will combine also the mobility schemes, parking, you know, and and so on and so on. So this is something which is crucial. Uh, it's it's not that it's still in. It's not a design future one. There are lots of uh, projects which are already under realization in the locality, which makes the task more difficult, but in the same time, if uh, there is one team who is kind of uh, doing this together, we uh, can preventively design these projects with having in, my, in our mind that that has to be some positivity and some goals to be achieved in the future. So we already run some preparation work on the energy efficiency in with, through the EPC method, which is uh, some of the buildings are already under elaboration of this. And there are three phases of modernization of ice hockey stadium. We are in the first uh, first phase, but that we have been selected for the project for the second phase for the construction of new energy center and reconstruction of cooling technology. And the third phase would mean that we will try to use the waste heat from the from the um, technology which is there. And there is a huge potential. So this is kind of. Uh, if we come back to this scheme, to this uh, picture, the use of waste uh, heat is there is a very huge potential for for this kind of positivity scheme uh, in the in the locality. Lessons learned. Um, uh, probably I can just pick up one that the involvement of stakeholders and users is crucial. We run interviews, walking groups, but we need to have the uh, real engagement. And real engagement, this is, I mean, like the most difficult, difficult part. And it also one of the biggest challenge for us as far as kind of critical conditions, because uh, I mean, like the changing of the mindset, I think it's one of the biggest challenge for us, because there is a still comfort zone and the business as usual run in the city and having or understanding what's 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 coming, uh, what what is the new, what are the trends it's very difficult to overcome in, in our case, not even with the partners out of the city administration, but also within the city administration and within the political political layer. This is very, very difficult. So I leave it, I leave it like that. There are some more information in the presentation, but I guess you'll share it with the participants so we can come back to that anytime. Thank you for your, for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, yeah, we will certainly uh, share all the presentation as well as the link uh, to the recording of the entire workshop. So we will have certainly follow up. Now we will change uh, city uh, and of course uh, changing gaps. Uh, we will uh, be going now to Geneva with Gilles Destieu. Um, and actually facing uh, uh, different issues as far as heritage buildings are concerned. So please, uh, Gilles, uh, the, the floor is yours. You can uh, share your screen. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Beatrice. Beatrice, thank you a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, uh, to attend this uh, meeting. So I will share my screen just a moment, please. And uh, okay. Great. Perfect. Um, so I'm Gilles Destieu, a professor at the School of Engineering, Architecture and Landscape in uh, Geneva. It belongs to the network of University of Applied Science, uh, Western Switzerland. Uh, for those uh, who know the, the, the same concept as Fachhochschule uh, in, in Germany, uh, Austria. Um, so my presentation uh, deals with uh, the energy retrofit at uh, the scale of neighborhoods, and uh, I will present uh, you the, the case, the case of city carvels in uh, um, Geneva. Um, first of all, so uh, regulation background in, in Switzerland, like uh, every country now, we are. Uh, we were, uh, were trying to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, uh, so there are two uh, main uh, uh, institutional drivers in, uh, in, in Switzerland. First of all, the Swiss Federal Strategy 2050 that uh, was launched uh, after the incident in Fukushima 2011, where the 
uh, Saudi Arabia Council uh, decided to uh, move away from uh, nuclear power uh, progressively. So it remains uh, still three uh, uh, nuclear power on the plant systems, but the idea is not to replace them once uh, they will be uh, 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 out of uh, function. Uh, so the idea to, to switch from nuclear power to renewable energy source, just to mention that the, the main uh, electricity production in Sweden is uh, nuclear power, and uh, but mainly more than 40% uh, is uh, hydraulic power. The PV uh, energy maybe uh, still only represents the three or four to ten percent of the uh, electricity mix, which is uh, still a few. So in this strategy, there is also a, a great support for a massive building with and, and the fuel switch. So the, the Swiss Confederation provides a, a half meter per year uh, in order to subsidize uh, uh, building with and fuel switch. There's also uh, a CO2 uh, low uh, about uh, climate. The, the, the target to reach a carbon neutrality. Um, they are still trying to revise the CO2 law, uh, but the, the, the revision were rejected by the patient on this term through a referendum because uh, it uh, involved to uh, tax, uh, yes, to, to, to introduce a lot of tax uh, for citizens, not then tax on the uh, flight uh, tickets, uh, on the uh, uh, yes, on gas, uh, uh, petrol, etc., and uh, the population did not accept to, to pay so, so so many taxes. Um, so also worth mentioning that uh, the the existing buildings still represent forty percent of energy needs, fourteen to five percent of the emission, and the retrofitting rate is still very uh, low. Uh, about uh, one uh, one percent per year, uh, and uh, more and more the states in Switzerland uh, uh, set target of uh, two point five per year or still uh, more. But uh, as we will see, even if uh, the subsidies are massive, it does is not sufficient uh, in some way to uh, to initiate a retrofitting work because it's very heavy, not so profitable. Um, so the, my presentation uh, focused on the, this case study of City Calvox, uh, which is a uh, neighborhood in downtown in Geneva. Uh, uh, it is uh, five blocks of a residential building, as you can see, 450 flats with some retails on the ground. Uh, they are social housing mainly. Owned by the Hospice General. The Hospice General is the main social assistance provider in uh, Geneva. So, this is uh, so it's all that the, the population is uh, rather not, uh, yes, uh, there is a, a particular social issue in, the, in, this, uh, in this case. The global retrofitting is in progress, uh, it's been in progress since uh, 2018. Um, so there was some slowdown of the work because of the, the COVID sanitary uh, situation, but um, they plan to finish the five slogs so by uh, uh, on next year normally. So, so far, uh, three of the five slogs has been retrofit. So the main issues are about, of course, energy, so the one thing, the main motivation of this. Also the heritage issue, as we will see, and uh, uh, social and uh, social economic aspect. So um, I will uh, then develop uh, those three issues. Just before that, just mention that we uh, carried out uh, this uh, the, uh, case study, uh, the framework of two research projects. First of all, the project term, uh, which is uh, financed by the uh, University of Applied Science of uh, Geneva. Uh, it focuses on gaps and levels of energy transition in the building and neighborhoods in Geneva uh, through uh, an interdisciplinary approach, uh, working on energy architecture, social economy, 
and also it is a, a collaboration between uh, three uh, 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 applied university schools in Geneva. So there's EPIA, which is my school, about engineering. There's uh, another school about uh, social Spain, and another one about management and economic issues. So it is very really interesting to, to work in this interdisciplinary way. So um, we mainly conduct those, uh, several case studies in Geneva through semi structured interviews. Uh, and one of those case studies is uh, the Calvert. Another project is an uh, interreg project, so the Swiss French collaboration ship between the school, between the University of Savoie Mont Blanc uh, in, uh, uh, in different sites, in the Gorge uh, du Lac and Annecy. Um, so uh, for uh, 2011, uh, there existed a solar catastrophe in the state of Geneva. But through this project, we extended this solar catastrophe to the greater Geneva, which is a transborder region, Swiss uh, French uh, region. Um, and uh, so it's very huge for, for this solar catastrophe, 2,000 uh, square kilometers, which is uh, very demanding for sense thermos uh, computation time for processing solar radiation on every building and roof of the, the region. And the idea through this uh, solar catastrophe to intensify uh, solar energy production, also working with a uh, local solar project and among those projects, the city Calvert again. So you have here the link uh, on the, uh, the, the web interface uh, of the solar catastrophe. Also worth mentioning that we are now developing a new version, uh, which will be a, uh, which, uh, Will be able also to uh, simulate self construction by building. So uh, it would be launched by the, the end of the year, normally by November, but with the, the same link. Um, the first uh, issue that I would like to develop more is about heritage. Here you can see, uh, because there is a, a geodata web service in Geneva, it's called FTG, you can access to many, many, many uh, special data, like heritage data, heritage map here. Um, you can see that almost every building in Geneva is classified uh, with different levels of uh, heritage protection. So there's building the with a strict heritage protection, like the historical building, et cetera. But other uh, buildings uh, that have, uh, that uh, are also references uh, into architecture that represent the typical period of architecture, which is the case of City Calvert. It was built during the 60s and it was built by the architect Honegger, which is uh, very um, uh, particular that, uh, yes, made a particular signature of the state. And then the, the state of Virginia would like to preserve this, uh, uh, this type of architecture. And so this. Uh, instead of five buildings are not strictly protected, but they are classified as uh, worthy of interest. So it uh, involves that uh, any intervention of this building to Mathenagy requires to negotiate with uh, uh, the, the administrative office. Uh, so that's the an heritage, also the heritage office, if you like, uh, in Geneva. And, uh, uh, resulted to reduce the scope for retrofitting as we will see. So the next uh, issue is about retrofitting and energy. So the retrofitting is uh, deals with uh, both indoor and outdoor retrofitting. So every flat, uh, all flats were refurbished, so are being refurbished. Um, which uh, involves a lot of uh, constraints for social aspects, as we will see. The roofs are, are insulated, but not the facade due to retage. So the, the retage issue uh, the limits uh, the renovation of facade, which reduce, of course, the, the reduction of uh, energy consumption. Windows are also refurbished, but also preserving the uh, uh, the some aspect of the, the initial windows, 
also work on uh, ventilation, so the, the heat recovery. And normally they, they plan to, but uh, I, I think it's, it's a bit too too low, uh, according to my opinion, if they are not refurbished the facade. So they plan to, to reach a heat index of uh, 140 uh, kilometers per, per, per square meter per year. I think it's, it's maybe too, too, uh, too ambitious. Uh, with uh, a partial uh, information, so we will see at the end. So you can, can yeah, you, you you see can some pictures of the work site, outdoor and indoor. About heat supply, so uh, so far the building was supplied by fuel, but there's a two switch that meant to connect the district or the neighbor to the district energy network, uh, which is uh, heated. Uh, supplied by the lake using a central heat pump. So there is, a, as you can see, you know, an extract of the energy master plan of uh, Geneva. There is a big project in Geneva to supply uh, cooling and heating with the lake of Geneva. Uh, there's a project for almost uh, uh, 300 megawatts. Of megawatts yeah. um, and then both PV transformation, then also there are also standing uh, PV uh, panels on the roof, so a total uh, 40 kilowatt peak. With uh, they would like to reach a self consumption rate of 70 uh, percent, not self consumption on the housing, but just only on the common part, like lighting, uh, the, the ventilation, etc. So the, the they are enough to 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 uh, to have a good self consumption rate, and so with the good self consumption rate, they they reach they, they plan to reach a payback period of uh, less than ten years. So this is uh, rather profitable. So, but social and economic issue that me that's maybe the biggest issue in this uh, project. Just some general remark on that. Uh, you know that uh, retrofitting was side often badly perceived by tenants, which uh, often leads to opposition. So there, really, they have, there is a real need of social support to inform, raise awareness, uh, facilitate empowerment uh, around the project. So that's why in Geneva, uh, the state of Geneva, together with the main uh, energy company, Proposed to subsidize uh, social support in the trafficking uh, uh, in three stages. First of all, information, community information to present the project, then assistance during the work site. And then once the retrofitting work has been done, there are also some information about awareness of eco actions so, so as to. Uh, guarantee that uh, uh, all the, the effort that's been done to, to reduce energy consumption would be uh, uh, implemented uh, uh, as, uh, according to the good behavior of the, the tenant. So in the case of uh, City Calva, uh, they did not use uh, the support proposed by the state of Geneva. They organized their own uh, support. Um, but with the main difficulty of uh, the refurbishment of uh, flats, as you can guess. So globally, in the first stage, uh, the work site did not go well at all. The owner did not anticipate and took into account the requisite needs. Maybe it uh, was not really experienced uh, enough with uh, such a project. So there was a big issue in particular on the inhabited work site. Uh, which are the really intrusive for the residents and also the duration of works were uh, much longer as planned. They also hire a social worker, but only at uh, 50%, which uh, is not enough to face all the demands of uh, uh, 450 uh, flats. So there was anyway a strong demand from residents energy renovation of the internet comfort. So this is, uh, uh, there was strong motivation, but uh, in reality, in the operational way, the, the work site was not uh, uh, so good in the first stage. So the owner was aware of 
these and improve the process for the two remaining uh, blocks on the stage in present uh, stage two. So more supportive providers demands are met uh, quickly and better, and now inhabitants are uh, systematically rehoused on the internet, which is a good improvement. The residents are also uh, compensated for this problem. So now, uh, uh, normally the, the work uh, work site is supposed to uh, to to, uh, to 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 progress uh, with more uh, in, in the, the the better manner. Uh, about um, the economic aspects, also globally in Geneva, as uh, I mentioned. Uh, so there's uh, from the strategy uh, 2050, as mentioned uh, in the beginning, there's a big service that is uh, federal and cantonal from, from the state of Geneva. Uh, for instance, uh, from uh, 70 to 100, uh, uh, 35 street francs per square meter. Which, uh, Subsidy, so you can on this link you have all the information that, and uh, there is also a general general law about uh, renovation. So normally the impact on the on the the, the owner can uh, impact uh, the, the cost of the uh, the, the traffic on rent, but with maximum of uh, plus uh, ten to francs by room and by month. Uh, uh, considering you see also a compensation uh, with the re reduction of energy load. So in the case of Calvot, there uh, they have not really a profitability targets, particularly in this uh, social uh, neighborhood. So they, they plan to uh, to limit uh, the, uh, the the rent increase. Not uh, on on case by case uh, basis, but not based uh, on on the, uh, the the current trends of the, of the different flats, which which are very different. So that's so. Just to conclude, uh, so what we learned uh, from uh, this case study is that energy is a uh, key and account of the renovation, but not sufficient on its uh, own. Uh, we we also saw that the social empowerment is very central to the process, to the success of the process. So the acceptance, the social acceptance, if you, if you want. And uh, the inhabited work site is very difficult to manage. So the residents really need to, to be, but the needs of residents should be better anticipated and handled through the social mediation support that is proposed by the state of Geneva. So uh, other general conclusions on gaps and levels. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the rate, uh, the literacy rate, rate is very low in Switzerland uh, because mainly because of the administrative burden. So to set up the size, it's very heavy, uh, still too heavy process to organize. And the, 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 the works are very costly, not really profitable, even if, uh, but it could be profitable, but it depends. Uh, so you have to balance between subsidy, between the possibility of uh, impacting the rent, and depending also on the reduction in terms of energy load. So it's rather co complicated, but fortunately we have a lot of labor. First of all, the climate emergency awareness. I think we are, everybody now is aware of the emergency. The lows, uh, are always more compulsory and uh, also subsidy is always more generous so for the moment so they represent a real lever and uh, yes I think that's all thanks for your your uh, assistance to, to this presentation thank you thank you very much uh, Gilles uh, this was I think very uh, inspiring, but also very familiar for us living in an heritage city like Rome. So we're facing many of the gaps uh, you mentioned, and I think it uh, will be very fruitful for further discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, now is the turn of Andy Carbonin from uh, Transpet. So we move uh, to Northern uh, Europe uh, in Sweden. And Andy, please, uh, the floor is yours. Wonderful. 
Thanks to uh, Beatrice and Marie for the invitation. My name is Andy Carvinen. I'm a professor of urban design and planning at Lund University in Southern Sweden. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today and I'm gonna give you just a brief presentation of TransPED, which is a, a new project that started this year. Um, and I think there's a lot of parallels with the previous speakers. So I, I will look forward to the discussion. So TransPED is Transforming Cities Through Positive Energy Districts. It's a two-year project um, that started this year. Uh, it's one of four JPI Urban Europe projects that uh, is focusing on positive energy districts. And TransPED is a project, it's an applied urban research project, and it focuses specifically on the governance of positive energy districts. And one of the starting points of our project is that energy, of course, is a central component of positive energy districts. It's a central component of urban development. But what's interesting is that it connects up with transportation, with water, with work and home life, with uh, growing and urban agriculture, with culture, with identity, and so on. So what we're gonna try to promote through the project is this very expanded idea of positive energy districts. They're situated energy innovation, but they're all also about a whole lot more that all adds up to sustainable urban transformations. So um, what we're doing with the project is we have five different PEDs. Uh, two are in Sweden, as you can see on the map. Uh, one is in Belgium and two are in Austria. And these PEDs are different sizes. Uh, there are different status of development. Some of them are very early. Some of them are very mature. Um, all of them have very strong energy components. Some of them classify themselves as positive energy districts. Others say, Sure, if you want to call us a PED, that's great. We're happy with, with that. Um, but certainly energy is at, at the heart of all of these uh, PEDs. Um, and what we're seeing is that, that, that TransPED provides an opportunity for the PED stakeholders in all these five different districts to number one, develop their own internal capacity, uh, but also share their, their experiences with other PEDs uh, across Europe. So it's both an inward focus and an outward focus. And just a very brief uh, outline of, of the aim of, of TransPED, it's really to develop this novel governance approach that can be adopted by PED stakeholders to realize deep and holistic changes to cities. And so we've got this kind of four-step process where first we're framing PEDs, what do they mean, how do we define them, then we're embedding this idea within each of the PEDs, uh, each of the five PEDs, then we're assessing uh, their, their performance in terms of energy, in terms of participation, in terms of transportation, different parameters that we find that are central. And then finally, how do we start to upscale these, these ideas? How do we start to upscale these uh, approaches to, to urban innovation? So one of the things that, that, that we recognize is that there are, um, you know, there's a focus on governance and there are multiple different agendas that we need to align to realize urban transformations. Um, and at the heart of this is detailed and in-depth discussions and, and uh, co-creation opportunities with our key stakeholders. And I think that's what we're talking about today is, is how do you engage with stakeholders in a productive way? And so this includes both politicians and policymakers, but planners and developers, and probably most importantly, residents and, and citizens of so civil society. Um, so so that's, that's how we're thinking about uh, PED development. And here you can see a list of all the project partners. I won't go through the list, but I will say that it's transdisciplinary team. So it's both public agencies, but also private and academic partners. Um, and the idea is that we really want to join up research and practice, um, both within each PED, but also across all five PEDs. Um, one of the interesting things I'll note here, you can see that that note at the bottom is that we have Confluences, who is a co-production facilitator based in Brussels, uh, and they're really helping us try to figure out how to engage all these different stakeholders through productive conversations. And then we also have 25 cooperative partners, and these are followers of the project. They're not funded by the project, but we think of them as friends, their community of interest that helps to amplify and extend the TransPED project agenda. Um, so we're checking in with them periodically, we're telling them about our project activities, uh, and we're also using them to disseminate our research findings. So it's really this network of learning. And when we talk about stakeholders, we're adopting a participatory action research approach. Um, this involves extensive 
interaction with our stakeholders. We want to learn from them. We want to act with them. Um, and it's really this idea of understanding uh, and acting through doing, uh, doing things on the ground. But one of the things that, that we want to emphasize is that it's context specific. Um, so we can't use generic universal principles about PEDS. Um, we need to think about something more than a one size fits all approach. Um, we need to align the energy ambitions uh, of PEDS with the physical and social conditions that are on the ground uh, in each particular neighborhood or each particular district. So it's really about this idea of generating situated knowledge production processes. Um, and then we also have to acknowledge that there's multiple perspectives. Um, so we want to bring the experiences and insights from experts, but we also want to find out from the, the people that live and work uh, and visit these districts. Um, so it's this transdisciplinary quadruple helix approach uh, that recognizes that there's going to be synergies, there's also going to be tensions, there's going to be agreement, there's going to be disagreement. So it's this real politics of, of urban development that we're focusing on. So, so we're going to be doing a, a sequence of different interventions within each PED. Um, so this will include interviews and focus groups and workshops. Um, what we want to do is map out the stakeholders that are involved. We've heard about this from previous speakers today. Um, we want to identify opportunities where we can interject, where we can apply the PED agenda. Um, we want to figure out who is doing what. And then we want to figure out how can we start to assess um, each of the PEDs in terms of their performance. Um, so we're currently in the process of creating a, a co-production methodology. Uh, and that's a big word, but it's really about a, a toolbox that we can use to support these engagement processes. Um, and so we're going to begin engaging with the stakeholders in each of the PEDs this month. Um, and then early next month, we're going to have a, a site visit. Um, we call them PED labs. And our first site visit will be in Brussels to the abattoir PED. Um, and we're going to go on a, on a, you know, on a, on a tour of the, of the PED, but then we're also going to do some co-production processes in, uh, in place and face-to-face. -face. We've been meeting online so far. So the outcomes, um, we want to develop a co-production approach, which I already talked about, uh, and we want to develop these helpful tools uh, to govern innovation. Um, they're not magic tools, but they're just ways that we can start to facilitate this process of, of co-production. And ultimately, we want to produce a community of practice that can feed into urban transformative capacity. So I'll leave you with uh, the website there is at the bottom right. Uh, and I'll put in the chat, we have just started a LinkedIn group for positive energy district professionals. And if you're part of LinkedIn, we'd love for you to join uh, and share your information, brag about all the amazing things you're doing in your projects, send us uh, event notifications and things like that. So I'd be very happy to, to talk to anybody about the, the, the TransPED project, but thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Andy. And Andy will be with us also tomorrow afternoon uh, discussing on the funding and business model aspects. So our last but not least presentation from Martin de Groot on Vito Energyville Gang. Uh, Martin, please uh, welcome. You can uh, share your screen. Thank you very much. Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, then we can go. It's uh... It's almost lunchtime, so it's me between you and, and lunch. Um, nevertheless, I will not rush because it's not a pleasant presentation, but um, I will keep it condensed. Um, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for the invitation. And, and I think actually the original reason why you had asked me is because as from last Friday, I'm the official project coordinator of the Open Lab project. Um, we were one of the, or we are one of the three uh, Horizon 2020 Green Deal projects um, that has won. But as the official project kickoff will be only the 20th of October, I cannot go too much in detail about the project as such. But um, the aim of today is, is rather to provide you a perspective how living labs actually can, can drive a transformational change of, of your uh, positive energy neighborhoods or drive the transformational change of the urban area. As you notice, I will sometimes speak about pets and the districts, but I also will use quite a lot of terminology in neighborhoods because personally, I think it fits better for the match that we are focusing on. Um, getting back to the basis of, of, of the drive of our research is that 
from an urban energy challenge. Um, I think we are all aware that the challenge is, is enormous. Huh? So um, more than 95% of the existing residential building stock needs to be renovated and not um, shallow, but we need to undergo a deep renovation by 2050. That is one. Second, um, it is remarkable that actually, and, and especially in, in Belgium, maybe um, it's different across Europe, but there is quite a lot of financial possibilities available. Right? We see, for example, in Belgium, we can say 40 to 50% of the households can actually finance an in-depth renovation. I do not say that we have to forget the other 50%, but it means that there is financing and it's still not being um, lifting up. So there is much more need for a servitization, non-energy benefits, comfort, um, how to provide an investment perspective. So that's the other side of the metal that we need to focus more. And I think if you see that from a climate neutral 2050 perspective, then we cannot go otherwise than having this cross-sectorial energy system integration. And I think that is exactly where, where PETS or PENS, positive energy neighborhoods, actually come, come into play. Um, I think everybody here around the table, I'm preaching for, for the choir. We are aware that, that we are not talking anymore about large central uh, power plants or individual building renovation, but we need to shift to this, this neighborhood approach. But this neighborhood approach has a lot of advantages and technicalities. And it's a mix of, of both very technical, think about energy grid end-to-end -end smartification, think about new generations of district energy systems um, or collective renovation. But the social factor is immense. And, and for me, that is the maybe the main difference between overall energy communities and, and pets is where for a pet you have a your 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 boundaries and you really have a community that has a very strong impact on the whole transition of that neighborhood now it has been discussed enough that that pets have this very integrative approach yeah? but that makes it at the same time very complex for a market uptake and a market rollout um, we have, if, if, if you see here the visual, it is both on site or very nearby actions. I think about the renovation process of the buildings, uh, think about local production of renewables, active energy management, both on the building level, but also the interaction between buildings, the interaction between different services and systems. Um, think about the interaction with the grid. And you move forward, then you go to the next levels. What is the energy system? How do you do energy trade, smart electricity grid, and so on? connection to mobility, industry to, to, for example, excess heat, and then your boundary conditions. Yeah? So, so you, have, you have a certain legal framework, how can you adjust it? You need to have your proper business model, community building aspect, very crucial, and spatial planning. So it's, it's a very complex aspect. And if you want to develop business models, you have to take into account that for a lot of private actors, this is not an evidence. Um, we had a a very um, comprehensive market research, both qualitative and quantitative um, research. Um, so both online as in-depth interviews with, let's say the main innovators in the field, uh, both SMEs and, and large companies. And, and what came out of their um, innovation needs that they had was that first of all, they said, okay, we are done with, with small scale pilot projects, um, renovating one, one house, um, installing one renewable energy system, that is not what it will do. We really need challenging pilot projects. This can be on neighborhood scale. This can be 30 buildings. This can be 100 buildings. This can be a large governmental project. So the tender processes needs to invite to have challenging and innovative. At the same time, uh, many companies said like, okay, we, we actually need uh, knowledge and exchange on, on other sectors that are more and more interconnected. For example, we, we work together with Daikin. They say like, okay, we are experts on, on level of heat pumps, but we want to know how electric mobility or renovation processes, how that interfere with our technologies. Um, and that's a third point as well. How, how does it interact on, on a technology perspective from, from a district perspective? <clears throat> and uh, the second last innovation aspect that they pointed out is that the real life test environment is crucial. Huh? They, they all have their proper laboratories, but they, they very often miss the real life test environment and especially from a district perspective. And then the last that goes a little bit broader is 
many of these companies go beyond only the energy aspect. Eh? For example, um, rainwater infiltration, accessibility, um, <clears throat> LCA, life cycle assessment, and, and these kind of things. It's, it's a broader picture that they acquire for their innovations. <clears throat> Apologize. And if you, if you merge all these innovation needs, you actually come very close to what the basis is of a living lab. And it's no surprise that you actually see across, or we notice that across Europe, these energy living labs are, are popping up and, and are being uh, implemented more and more. Um, we have uh, done a benchmark. We come to about 34 living labs that we found. So that's, that's quite a lot. And I think that very clearly shows how the market is um, evolving or how research organizations and markets are evolving. But so then the question is, is what, what are living labs? Um, and here, I first of all would like to refer to the European network of living labs. I mean, if, if there is one organization that can define a living lab, it, it's them, of course. They are also partner of, of the project. And so that's, we're very happy to have them in board, on board. And we see, see several different types of living labs from online platforms for data sharing or internet of things. We see um, climatized halls where uh, buildings are, where the, the complete climate can be that. We see neighborhood, very large neighborhood approach. We see individual buildings. We see test cases for a variety of, of building typologies and building use. Um, so what actually then is a living lab? Well, I, I think all of them to a certain extent are living labs. Yeah? So if I go back to the definition set by European network of living labs, it's first of all, they are user-centered. So it's really about the, the users to take them in your open innovation ecosystem. That's one. Second, it is also a co-creation approach so that <clears throat> private actors, research facility uh, organizations, local authorities, and the users, they actually co-create your innovations. Um, and you have this innovation process in real life communities and settings. And so there, and I think it's, it's mentioned several times before you then the, the typical quadruple helix. Some, some people speak about the quintuple helix, um, but the aim is and that actually these different um, actors and stakeholders of the ecosystem actually collaborate um, between each other. And actually on that way, you create your joint value uh, creation and your prototyping for a market uptake. I find this visual very clarifying on, on where, <clears throat> where living labs actually um, have their space. If you see the process flow of, um, yeah, you can call it the technological readiness level or, or innovation uptake, um, starting from a fundamental research, we notice actually, that's my proper experience, it's, it's quite well, I will not say easy, but there is quite a lot of funding publicly available for uh, in-depth research. And then once there is a market uptake of your, of course, you have your venture capital, bank loans and so on, because you have your business case. But our experience is that actually finding the money between the market uptake and the fundamental research, that's where the living lab is situated. That is also the difficult place. Uh, um, very concrete for our proper project um, from, from Horizon 2020, you get easily funding for innovative um, solar panels, for example. But if you just need bricks and, 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 and basic insulation, well, that will not be funded by Horizon 2020. Huh? So that you have to get by the building owners. But if you want to go it to bring it uh, very comprehensive, it is not that easy to gather all that financing. So that's quite a difficult gap to, to fill in. And that's actually my main task as well within Vito and Energyville to find how we can manage that and how to create a business case around that. Um, the next point, and then especially from starting from a research perspective and bringing it to the, the market uptake is um, the risk valorization. Um, when I speak with, with, with business developers of, um, of pets, Basically, they say that the business value for a pet, especially, for example, in Belgium, but for sure also in other countries, it's a very um, narrow margin. Um, very concretely, in Belgium, the, the gas prices in, um, in relation to the electricity prices are very low. Yeah? So there is a large advantage for gas 
condensing boilers versus heat pumps, for example, or versus district energy systems. Um, and from that perspective, the business case is very tight. So they really have to be precise, but they say there's a lot of uncertainties which we need to include in our business plan, the large fork, and then we have to include the worst scenario. So the more detailed your uncertainty can be um, pointed out, the better we can make the business models. Um, so that is the, the request there. And when we talk about uncertainties, it can be technical uncertainties. Um, for example, what will be the heat demand after renovation? And so if you foresee a district energy system, what will be the final heat demand? Um, how will new technologies interact? Um, that kind of things. From an economic perspective, um, you see it now across Europe, energy prices are going crazy. Um, one year ago, nobody had thought prices were going to behave like that. So how do you take that into account? Legal aspect, if your legal boundaries, um, for example, across Europe, a lot of changes are hopefully coming related to energy communities. Are there potential changes? And then from a social perspective, of course, and like, what if we, what is there, if there's a plan for the implementation of a pet in a certain district, how many building owners will join the process? Um, what will be their percep perception of um, district uh, systems? And, and so, as, as I pointed out in the beginning here of this slide, it, this narrow mar margin for the business case really needs to be developed further. And I think from a business, from a living lab perspective, you do not have to be necessarily um, beneficial. And so you can have calculated losses exactly to find out where these um, uncertainties are. One crucial aspect also, and I think maybe a, a difference between a pet pilot project and a pet living lab, if we can say so, is, is how and what you do with the data. And the data aspect, you have a lot of IP issues, a lot of complexity there. How do you share data between each other? Um, but it is, it is crucial for your living lab as a service that you offer to the technology providers that you can actually um, foresee detailed data on how the different systems operate, not only on an individual basis, but also to one another. How is uh, comfort being perceived by user behavior? Um, how are users reacting to certain um, aspects? For example, when we lower the heat to have a flexibility mechanism, will users um, ask for a, a higher heat or more heat anyway? Um, and from this perspective, in, in the living that we plan, we will foresee also redundant systems. So we will not only have a, a gas condensing boiler, but we will also have an individual heat pump and we will also have a, a small scale district energy system. We can compare these three systems with the same users. So there is the concept of redundant systems. You will, of course, not include in a, in a pet pilot case and only in a pet living lab. And so there the aim is really to, to create packages of commercial viable and repl replicable solutions. And for me, these solutions are not only products, but it's also, also services. So, so we use this, these packages that you do not go anymore with, with single products and single um, services, but you go to packages, you bring them to the market. <coughs> A very important aspect um, is how to include your um, private actors in this process. How do you include private actors in a living room? Because you actually have several phases. Um, you have ones that the living lab is there, it's quite easy to attract them with the services that you provide, but how do you attract them to participate from the start? Um, in the living lab that we will be rolling out in Genk, we have included six um, commercial actors from, um, yeah, I, I mentioned before Daikin, but we also have SMEs with plug and play um, technical boxes for uh, heat pumps, uh, battery systems, and, and so on. Um, we have also contractor companies that provide servitization for entire neighborhoods and so on. And so the, the question is, what can we offer them? And, and here you see an overview of, of what we offered them. Um, I think the main important was that they really could test their new products and their new services in a safe environment. And so that the, the users, they are aware that they are part of a living lab story. They are aware that it can go wrong once in a while but there will also be a compensation, of course. And so that's part of the storyline as well. What kind of compensation do they expect? So from that perspective, the, the participants, the private actors, they have access to data 
more than their proper data. And they have, as mentioned before, a heat pump uh, supplier like Daikin has access also to what's happening on level of, of battery charging or e-mobility and, and so on. Um, and, and I think for the, the research organizations here around the table, the, the value of course that we can offer on the expertise and the innovations there, I think it's important to put in the spotlight as well. So very concrete, I can, I, this I can show. Um, to have more information about the project, I will refer later on to the public lounge and, and to, to the website. But I am based in, um, in, in Energyville. It's the building that you see on the bottom right. Um, before there was a Cascais um, office, this is my office. Contrary to in Portugal, the sun is shining here, but I think it should be the opposite. Normally in, rain, in Belgium, it's always raining and gray. But so we have um, um, a business area, which is called the Torpark, and that's also why we call the, the Open Tor Living Lab. Um, it's based in Genk in Belgium. And we have both, and that is new, um, we have both a combination of a business area and a residential neighborhood that we will include in this storyline. And as mentioned, we will focus really on this open innovation. So we have um, four research institutes on board. We have um, industrial partners on board. We have the uh, city of Genk on board. We have social housing company on board. And we have um, facilitators and, and innovation clusters on, on board. And that is an, the aim of having really this co-creation aspect to create actually this rapid prototype of these new products. I cannot go too much in detail yet, otherwise I would spoil my public launch of the Open Lab project. Um, as mentioned, it just started last Friday, 1st of October, so we're really still very green behind the, the ears. Um, but the aim is there to, to repeat this approach of a living lab, positive energy neighborhood in an existing urban area in the cities of Genk in Belgium, in Pamplona in Spain, and in Tartu in uh, Estonia. Both Tartu and Pamplona, they're also um, smart city lighthouse projects already. So they have already quite a, a process behind them on smart, uh, smartness aspects. And now they will target very specific buildings. In, um, in Pamplona, it will be a combination of a commercial building and social housing. In Belgium, as mentioned, it will be focusing on the social housing and individual buildings combined um, or linked to a business area. And in Tartu, the focus will be on um, Soviet-style apartment buildings. Um, so that is um, our main news that we can bring. So there is also the website. And if any questions, either you can use the chat or you can send me an email, which you see here. Thank you very much. And um, well, if any questions, happy to follow up. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, also for the to all speakers for being very timely in their presentation. Uh, I think we um, have some uh, questions in the chat. We have several questions from the audience. Uh, so maybe we can start from the last one. Andy Carvon ask, uh, um, no, just, no, uh, just in, uh, yes, just uh, individuate uh, the link. Uh, uh, a link to the group for positive energy district professional. This could be an added value for everyone here. So at the, very, at the end of uh, our event, we will forward this invitation to everyone. Thank you, Andy. Then you have Sergei Levchenko. Yes. yes, I think we can start with the very first one uh, from Sergei Levchenko. Is there a difference between the results of your analysis and the existing official information? I think this was to uh, Joao uh, Dinis in Cascais, right, Sergei? Maybe Sergei has left already. Uh, Sergei also put another question. Lately, there has been a lot of pessimism about achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement on the basis of renewable green energy. You are only optimistic or also pessimistic after conducting pilot studies. And a third one from Sergei. Have you carried out a comparative analysis of the efficiency of central and decentralized heating systems? So maybe, maybe Joa, you feel like 
coming here and you can directly answer to Sergei. Okay, so um, the problem is that we, we don't have uh, district heating uh, and cooling in Portugal. So it's something that it's fairly from uh, Central European. We do have a project that allowed us to have a first glimpse on it. And we made an assessment of the estimations that we would need to, to, to do. So it does save, it's much more energy efficient, but as you can imagine, if you have a whole urban area with a hundred, well, at least 66 square kilometers without any single infrastructure on EHC, it would be completely uh, impossible to, to, to leverage the costs unless it would be a long-term concession which companies are obviously not interested in, uh, with. So, but the thing is that we have something that Central European doesn't have, which is a lot of sun. And we have, there's a lot of market solutions for, for uh, decentralized heating. Uh, the second uh, question was, if I'm not mistaken, it was about the difference between pilots. So the pilot expectation and the real results. Uh, they are very similar, but the, and, and so I would say that the, the, the production, the real production is not the issue here. Uh, and uh, one evidence of that is the sheer amount of companies, private owned companies, that they want to work and develop their own system with our facilities to the point that we think that we have to do a general broad concession and um, have a bigger investor on this. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the, the, the challenge is indeed the legal the legal uh, analysis that we need to do for both contract and for benefits, because we are one part of the, of the stakeholders here. And the first question is, if I'm not uh, refining. No, I, th I think those were because the first one was actually a oh, the comment. Um, and the comment is uh, uh, about being optimistic or pessimistic. I'm, I'm positive, <laughs> I'm positive, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again uh, for participating to these very first uh, two sessions of the morning. Um, so now we will be having uh, uh, a not too long uh, uh, lunch break because we are supposed to be back at quarter past two for the interactive session. So I wish you, I will keep, uh, of course, the link, uh, uh, the Zoom link open. So you can simply just uh, put it in a waiting mode. Uh, go have an excellent lunch and see you in uh, 45 minutes. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm sorry for the very quick uh, lunch break, but you're seeing that we have a very intense uh, two days of work. Um, I have seen that among uh, the participants, we have the honor to have uh, Mikel Pero, our cost officer. So I would like to ask uh, Michael if he wishes to, to say a few words to us. Thank you for being with us. Yes, and apologies not to be part, uh, to participate to the entire uh, meeting. Do you hear me well here from Brussels? Very, very well. Thank you. Okay, okay. excellent. Yeah, yeah, maybe just, just a few words because I could not come uh, um, this morning. Uh, the MC1 season of, these, of the actions have started and uh, you will see that some actions actually have some um, uh, points in common with yours. So I hope uh, I can facilitate also some collaborations. Um, what I would just uh, shortly like to say, um, first of all, well, uh, the context. So um, just for you to know that um, we are now moving in the Horizon Europe uh, very soon from the 1st of November, the actions in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, just to maybe say that um, when we look at the terms of what we are discussing in terms of collaborations for the future within Horizon Europe, uh, there's a central uh, place for the stakeholder engagement. Um, and in that respect, um, cost actions are there uh, as a platform to facilitate the exchanges between academics and scholars, of course, but also going beyond. 
And uh, today uh, we know that, uh, and especially for Europe, um, it's important not to stay within, um, within the research field with our results, but uh, to reach out and uh, to see to what extent the results are uh, concretely exploitable uh, for, uh, for society as a whole and, and for practitioners. And this is a huge challenge. We already know it's not new what I'm saying, but uh, I guess uh, now um, the, the seeking uh, uh, solutions that would work on the ground um, is, uh, is crucial and it gets uh, more, more pressing with time. Uh, and I think your action actually is, uh, is clearly tilted um, towards addressing this issue. Uh, it's part of the memorandum of understanding. You made it very clear that you wanted to engage and, and the event today uh, actually shows this initiative. You actually are uh, starting actions yet. However, you already have these initiatives uh, to engage uh, with stakeholders and especially here we are uh, hosted by Italy and uh, so maybe the Italian community is maybe a little bit more uh, addressed today but uh, the idea to, to do um, to engage locally I think it's an extremely good idea and I would like to uh, congratulate of course uh, the chair the entire core group and, uh, and all the MC to, to take, to take uh, these, these initiatives. Um, okay, I think I, I said already quite a lot, but I, I, I want to say uh, also a warm uh, welcome uh, to all the stakeholders, or uh, I, would, I should maybe say um, uh, city representative or local authorities that are represented here. Uh, it's very nice for you to, to also be part and to, and to see to what extent uh, this dialogue that you already had in the previous day, I think, but that you will continue to have. Uh, this afternoon uh, may, be, uh, may be fruitful uh, um, and would be in, in a way uh, um, uh, turn into a win-win a win uh, um, outcome. Uh, so I see that you have um, planned a co uh, actually an, a World Cafe and I'm very happy to that because it's indeed it's uh, through these participatory methodologies, may it be face-to-face uh, -face or online, that we can in indeed facilitate the dialogue and, and finding uh, ways to collaborate uh, further in the future. So uh, um, Maria, I think uh, I can give back the, the, the word to you. Uh, uh, or is it Paola? Sorry, I cannot see you exactly. No, it's, uh, it's Beatrice. <laughs> Beatrice, sorry, sorry, I cannot see, I cannot see you. Uh, apologies. So Beatrice, so, ah, now I, now I can. Uh, Maria Beatrice, yeah, that's why. Uh, so yeah, I would like to give back the floor to you. Uh, this was really a quick welcome, but just, uh, yeah, it, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'll, I'll try to stay at least until 3 p.m and to participate to the first round of the World Cafe. Uh, but again, thank you for the invitation and, and thank you for this event. And thank you very much for, for the very important uh, words that uh, you use, because certainly uh, at the beginning this morning, one of the very first things that we say is that today is a day to celebrate. Uh, because the, after 20 months, this is really the very first opportunity that we have to meet with people in person, although with some restrictions, but still I'm happy to say maybe a two uh, important things. One is that uh, uh, we are able to have 25 people from 12 different European countries here in Rome for the in-person session, but also that the event is fully blended, meaning that also the World Cafe, we are hosting both the four tables here in place uh, in Sapienza, but also uh, the online uh, Zoom rooms. So basically we will be working in parallel uh, for the World Cafe, so everybody will have the opportunity to contribute. And this is one thing. The other thing which I think is worth mentioning, as you say, is that uh, there are not only people from academia or researchers in general. Um, and so the idea uh, with, with my colleague, uh, Paola Clerici, when we uh, were start thinking about this, this workshop was actually to host uh, and to give voice to the municipalities. Because of course, especially for the positive energy districts, but in general for urban transition and sustainability, it is very important that um, as many stakeholders as possible have a say. 
So all the activities uh, we, we are developing together with the core group of the cost action is actually addressing different audiences, uh, different target stakeholders, and not only just giving space to the researchers or, or to the science, pure scientific disseminations, but actually providing everybody uh, with the opportunity to have a say in those important and crucial uh, topics uh, we, we are facing. So uh, today has been structured in the morning. I'm just saying that because you, you could not uh, attend. We had the opportunity to listen to different cities, uh, representatives, as well as framing and explaining how the cost action has been structured in the various activities uh, among the, the four uh, working groups. Um, and tomorrow we will be having actually uh, the Italian municipality. As you say, also the local engagement is very important. So try also to, to, to give the municipalities as well as the researchers the opportunity to start new networking activities and work together in developing the uh, products and results of, of the action. Um, and tomorrow we will also having other aspects uh, looking forward because, uh, of course, specific aspects as far as investment funding and business models, for instance, are topic which are sometimes quite difficult for the, say, uh, pure scientific research point of view. And we will be having also the opportunity to listen to specific contribution from the city officers as well as from the institutions as far as those aspects are concerned. Um, so now I think I can uh, again share my screen and uh, uh, provide you with what's uh, coming uh, um, now. Okay, so um, again, a, a little bit of uh, just a reminder for the Zoom etiquette. We, we went through this already this morning, but uh, uh, I can confirm that I have received the, the consent for video and images from all the speakers. So I want to thank them as well. Uh, so now we will be starting actually providing a quick uh, uh, overview of what's next. Uh, as you can see, the session for brainstorming is actually articulated uh, in these twofold uh, modalities. So we will be having uh, physical uh, uh, tables, uh, and the tables uh, will be hosted by uh, different, different colleagues, uh, the, the working group uh, uh, representative from the four working groups. And at the same time, we will also be having the virtual work effect. So this will be, as already been said, we will be working in four different uh, uh, rooms and working on mural. At the end, of course, we will meet all together just to uh, exchange ideas in terms of finding and, and what came after the work affairs sessions. But let me uh, just briefly explain how we want to uh, structure this discussion, this brainstorming. So basically, uh, we have been identifying four gap clusters. As you know, uh, the, the old focus uh, is looking for gaps. So we, we somehow have been repeating these, uh, these uh, questions like a mantra, because we would like really uh, to focus on what we need to do, uh, what, are, what is in our agenda, what are actually not only the challenges, because the gaps is something different from a challenge, I think. Uh, and so we want to explore different cluster. The first uh, cluster, as I mentioned, refers to investment funding and business models. Um, and here, of course, uh, is what I was mentioning a little bit more difficulties in trying to isolate and understand what we need to look for. So certainly identifying investment concepts able to accelerate the transition to positive energy district is a key aspect. Because of course, positive energy districts in terms of timing, risk profile, and most of all, return on investment, which is, as you, as you know, of course, related to the first two elements, is something that still 
uh, lack in terms of identification on how best we can progress in that direction. We all know, uh, and you can look at it in, uh, uh, in the brainstorming question number two, we need to innovate in funding a business model, because if we want to take advantage of different financial sources, which are different from EU grants or municipality funding, we need to involve different stakeholders. We have seen that this morning very clearly, I think, in the cities, uh, European cities presentation, for instance, how much important it is to understand what the investors are looking for, what are the enabling factors, what are the enabling ecosystems. At the same time, uh, in, uh, research, in uh, brainstorming question number three, uh, the, the idea of incorporating financial and private sectors to increase the public budget, but also attracting private investment is very important. And we need to do that in at least in three different moments when we are dealing with research, in implementation, but most of all in evaluation. And I would include also as well the, the adaptive monitoring phase of TEDS. Of course, uh, uh, adopting a life cycle approach is very relevant. The fourth brainstorming question that uh, uh, we have been thinking about uh, flagging the, in the work affair refers to the design of a financial mechanism able to overcome conflicting budget allocation across scales, because of course we know how much important it is the cooperation at different level from the say the European up to the local, but also bridging between benefits for the community and return on private investment. So here I'm mostly referring to market-based instruments. We know, for instance, that in other similar sector, like water management, for instance, um, some specific market instrument, market-based instruments, uh, like payments for ecosystem services, have been something extremely useful in progressing uh, this field. Uh, the second gap uh, clusters refer to rules, regulation, programs, and procedures at local level. Of course, uh, we, we have to face uh, what is already in place, what is existing in terms of spatial planning and zoning plans at local level. But what do we need? What do we miss? Which gaps are we able to identify? How best can we steer this kind of tools and instruments to progress uh, positive energy districts. The other aspect, of course, refers to rules, regulation, and programs. Do we need something specifically supporting PET? And which gaps, again, can we identify? And the other emerging concept, of course, is, refers to the brainstorming question number three. So how might we improve the multi-level policy uh, frameworks? in the gaps that we can, of course, identify. The last point I think is, uh, is uh, already in the agenda of several uh, initiatives referred to positive energy districts. And these refer to protocols and standards uh, towards a possible, say, validation, assessment, and monitoring, also looking forward in terms of PET certification. Um, the third gap, uh, which is again uh, extremely relevant, refer to capacity building. Capacity building, of course, at different levels. For instance, uh, and this also mirrors, I think, the efforts we are making with the action, refer to the target groups that are needed to facilitate transition to PET. Which specific empowerment do we need to put in place? Um, but also thinking at a different scale, what is needed to mobilize the stakeholder ecosystem on PED? Uh, the third uh, brainstorming question refers also to different, uh, again, uh, stakeholders. Because of course, we need to uh, provide education. We need to provide exchange of ideas. We need to incentivate proactive approach to positive energy districts. So again, civil servants, but also urban doers. The fourth one is also looking how we can foster cross fertilization and cooperation. Because for instance, we know, and we, we are well aware that municipality 
tend to think uh, uh, in silos. And of course, we need to provide actually uh, enabling again factors and elements to, to give them the opportunity uh, to change uh, the working environment, to try and, and exchange experiences and cooperate even more to align towards the common goal. And the last one is also referring uh, to actually raising the bar at an international level in a peer-to-peer -peer learning process. The fourth and last uh, uh, gap uh, cluster that we have identified refers to enabling technologies. Of course, here we can uh, identify the three pillars that uh, we know are actually supporting the whole concept uh, of positive energy districts. So the energy efficiency technologies needed uh, to support transition according to the different contexts. For instance, we have been already touching this aspect this morning very well, confronting cities uh, that are dealing with, say, new development versus other cities which are more concentrated on intervening on heritage buildings but also the opportunity to integrate e-mobility. So uh, energy efficiency is not just uh, thinking in terms of renewables, but also trying to be creative and, and integrate and progress the whole concept of smart cities as well. The second referred to the flexibility. And, and again, we had very interesting uh, uh, input in the impulse this morning, because of course, we also understood how much important are the communities to provide this flexibility. Um, the energy production, of course, is at the very uh, core of the PED concept, uh, the idea of transforming the consumers into prosumers, but also the idea of a uh, um, very important aspect of security in terms of energy supply, but also renewable energies availability. Um, a key aspect, which I think is still uh, very much to be debated and discussed in order to progress, uh, refers to the validation of all the calculation, for instance, on annual energy balance. Um, and the last one, last but not least, of course, uh, refers to this wider category of appropriate technologies, meaning enabling communities also uh, and municipality to tackle affordability of housing and at the same time supporting uh, uh, communities in terms of contrasting the energy poverty. Um, I think this is, uh, this is actually what uh, I wanted to, um, to ask you and to, to refer to you in terms of uh, having uh, uh, a base for, for a common discussion. So maybe I would like to uh, ask the audience uh, if you have some questions or you wish uh, to make some comments on the gap uh, uh, clusters. Uh, of course, those gap clusters have been shared among the whole core group, and we had the opportunity to exchange ideas, um, which is something, again, going behind the, the, the specific tasks of the working group, but actually also taking into account what municipalities have already been communicating to the, to the scientific community in the different uh, projects referring to PET. So if you have uh, some specific comments, you can please include them in the chat. Uh, but if you have not, uh, we can, uh, uh, we, uh, two uh, working group uh, for uh, colleagues, uh, young colleagues, uh, two young PhD uh, candidates, Alessandro Saccoluzzi and Marco De Libaoli, uh, we could start uh, actually activating the Zoom rooms. Okay, those are the... I don't see specific comments uh, at the moment. So I think we could... Uh, now people are entering the, the, um, the session. So we will maybe just allow a few more minutes for people to join. And then we can move uh, to the different rooms. 
developing and implementing a positive energy district. And this model uh, is uh, funded by different kind of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of types, different type of topology of funding, which are, which maybe are, uh, can be organized in two type uh, according to the duration of the funding and the level of uh, this kind of uh, funding. For example, according to the duration, we have long time funding strategies in different countries or one time, one shot, let me say, uh, or yearly uh, funding. For example, we have Spain, Italy, or we have the, 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 the case of Austria where there is no kind of uh, uh, planning for funding, but there is just one time uh, investment uh, for funding. And or Greece, when we have yearly uh, funding. And uh, related to the level, we have uh, surely the next generation Europe uh, uh, funding that uh, provide some uh, uh, subsides for the, for the renovation of building and efficiency and technologies to be applied in the buildings. Or for example, in Spain at a large scale Dries Street, uh, so they are going to funding and to, to help the, the renovation at the larger scale. Uh, but at the same time, we have also the national funding and or local. For example, in, this, in the case of Bosnia, they don't have, uh, as they are not in Europe, they, are, uh, they have just local investment or, or solution. Yeah, we cannot see, yes, sorry, sorry, <laughs> yes. They are providing me uh, to correct me. Yes, they are. They then cannot accede to the to the uh, EU funding. Um, regarding that, again, uh, regarding to the case of Greece, of uh, Bosnia, the the financial mechanism is uh, mainly related to the uh, AB AIB and to the um, the A ABRD, the for reconstruction development funding. So they are this kind of financial. Uh, mechanism, even if uh, they are um, um, there, sometimes the investment arrive from the external broad country, for example, Germany, they, they invest from their own uh, technologies with the provider of their own technologies, they arrive in the country, they, they use their technology, and the, the, the financial mechanism is with the banks from Germany. So this is something that is very, maybe is more specific uh, for Bosnia, but uh, this kind of solution maybe it can be enlarged in other country. And I mean, maybe in Greece, there is something like uh, in this way. Uh, coming back and uh, concluding, um, the, the concept of PED is lacking in the, in the sense that we don't have the name of PED for these programs. And this is gap surely for, as I said, for the investor and the promoter. And uh, also we revealed that the, the concept of energy communities, which is strictly related to the PET concept, even if is not clearly described and funded in the different countries. So uh, before reaching the PED concept, maybe we need to describe exactly what is energy communities too as well. So we have this kind of uh, gap that uh, can be solved, we need to be solved. Thank you very much, Paolo, and Savis for working group two, please. So hello, everyone. Uh, we were working on the cluster one about the rules and regulation, and we had three questions. Uh, everybody were sharing which kind of existing rules and regulation they had. In a, either in a country they are working or in a country they are living and also which gaps they are identifying and how we can improve those gaps by new standards, rules and regulations. And if there is any uh, suggestion for uh, developing framework and standards and uh, kind of protocols. So in the first group, I'm going in order because uh, there were so many interesting things happening. Uh, many people discussing that the first thing is the gaps between sectors. It can be between private and public because in many countries, the, uh, the municipalities, the public sectors owns the energy or the production or distribution. 
or even the regulation. But if the private sector wants to take initiatives and kind of uh, invest and develop it, then there is a gap both regarding the collaboration and the communication between the public and private. So these gaps should be somehow filled. The other things was that in different countries, the, the national uh, level actually centralized the power or the energy, while the municipalities are controlling the spatial planning and land use planning. And these sectors, different level of sectors, they are not collaborating or there is not a very um, kind of transparency how the national and local can work for energy and also the city planning. While in other countries, uh, um, we have different sectors that work on uh, zone planning or on the special planning while the other sectors are working on energy. And again, these gaps between sectors are uh, existing. And uh, again, uh, at um, another level is that we don't have the model in different European countries. One country is different from the other. So even not is just between the sectors, but also national and international. And while we have this uh, policy for whole Europe that we need to have these 100 heads, uh, how we can actually come up to one model when we have different levels of uh, gaps and uh, differentiation in different sectors. And then um, many people discussed about the role of municipalities that in to fill these gaps, they gave the most power and maybe responsibility to municipalities, while also they were saying that uh, municipality either don't have the power or don't have the capacity or don't have the resources regarding the financial resources. And these kind of gaps can be different things in different countries. In some countries, they may have power, but they don't have the resources. In some countries, they may have resources, but they don't have the power. And um, there is um, many also discussed that because that we don't have any special model, because each context are different, maybe pets not even can be a kind of optimal solution on the country. So we shouldn't just talk about which technology we need to decrease energy. Maybe we need to start looking at just reducing the consumption, consumption, uh, consumption of the energy. So, uh, uh, and then it's also this, we discussed about the replication. So when we are so different and we cannot have one model that fits all countries or all contexts, maybe um, then it's also becoming difficult to have one head solution and model or framework. So the best thing is that to realize that city is a complex concept, and then we start to analyze how such complex system work. And then by that in different contexts, how different kind of actors can come up to manage these complexities. And um, for municipalities in different contexts, they should have different roles. Some of them can be enabler, some of them can be just facilitator or mediate, mediator, and some of them is, can be just regulator. So it also depends on the context they are talking about. And uh, um, many also come up, like we discussed, with all these gaps you are saying, and uh, you come up with some solution. If you want to say, what is the next step? What is your suggestion? And everybody is somehow saying that we need good policy and somehow is relates to the go good governance model. And uh, who is responsible for developing this governance model? Some saying that is the municipality's role because they can analyze the kind of this uh, city as a complex system. Somebody saying about uh, that this is the role of the uh, kind of the national, the gov national government because they have the power monopoly. And uh, some uh, even say that this is the role of academia and the university because they can be the kind of the uh, collaborator between the local and national level. And they are uh, doing so many initiatives to discuss these things. So they need to collaborate with the different levels of the government. And so one of the aspects that is come is that in this model, this governance model that we are talking about, we need to know which actors is responsible for what regarding the resources and the power they have. And we talked also a lot about the power imbalances in different contexts. And also is uh, the uh, kind of the integration of planning with energy is a political process and how we can actually uh, manage that. And uh, so the, the, another solution was that we need to know that all of our, our region is to create PET mm -hmm. and just say that we the status 
uh, call that we are now is, num is uh, point number A and our vision to get um, kind of half heads is number B. And it can be so many different uh, way of uh, going towards B, but it should be transparent. And uh, um, when we have this transparency regarding the process, then each district or each country can choose which way is suiting them rather than having the just kind of the uh, kind of one model. And also another thing is the, regarding the contextual factor that we need to include. One of them was also the cultural aspect, not just the culture as which country we are coming, but also the culture of collaboration. Because in some countries we have better collaboration culture. They mentioned in Netherlands, in some countries they don't have this culture. Like for example, in Italy, like the way that people are maybe don't have the trust to the municipalities or different things. So this contextual factors also came up many times. That is the cultural aspect is about the building. For example, in Italy, the historical uh, kind of buildings needs to be taken into account and maybe not all the solutions for PED we are discussing suit it. And then uh, also the hybrid model of governance is not just about top down, but also bottom up, but both of them are necessary. So everybody discussed that is not if enough that we just say bottom up that people take the initiative, but we need some a specific actor to take the responsibility or take the ownership of the process to lead the process. Without that a specific person, nobody will kind of take care. And also with the example of Denmark, they're saying that even if people are paying tax to the municipality, so they are somehow owning the process. But again, we say that if just paying our uh, taxation may cause the people who are receiving the money to run the process. So it's very uh, important that we clear um, which kind of responsibilities and roles each individual or each institution should have. So, yes, I think these are the kind of the summary of what we have discussed. So if there is anything I should, I should mention, just say. Perfect. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Savis. And then at the end of the rapporteur speech, we will be having also some final remarks from the audience, also for the people who are online. So please, uh, Oscar. Oscar Seco for Working Group 3. Thank you very much, Beatrice, <laughs> and thank you to the rest of the listeners. In our cluster three, uh, we talk about the technologies, and including the technologies, we have five questions, but we take these technologies, it's just uh, five questions, it's just like in the whole group. It's about uh, efficiency, flexibility, production, and some kind of validation of the uh, production of these uh, technologies. At the end, we get it down that in the, in, in the mark of the technologies, we have to think on the smart cities or in the city, in the normal city, and where do production, and we have uh, two big scenarios. One is the production if you produce this energy in the same place, and the other scenario is you have to buy this energy because you don't have to any way to uh, produce the energy that you need. Talking about the <laughs> talking about the first uh, possibility that you can produce your own energy. One of the things that we have to think on it is this technology is focused goes to the uh, prosumer. If that means that uh, the same uh, people or the same house or the same building, whatever, produce the energy that they need, maybe they produce more energy than they need. Usually this kind of energy comes from renewable system of producing and uh, this at the end focused, is focused on the uh, two different windows, the distribution and the rehabilitation of energy building. If you want to don't need energy, you can produce it or you don't waste it. If you have a rehabilitation of energy building, you don't, have, you don't need a, 
whatever, 80% energy, whatever, depending the case, depending the weather, depending the place where you have it. Uh, other important point is uh, talk about the storage. With kind of energy you can store it. Uh, if you uh, can store it electrical energy or you can store it the thermal energy or whatever. Another thing is if you need some elect uh, energy, which type of energy, you can produce this type of energy from different technologies. For example, if you need electricity or you need, what do you need? You need hot water or you need electricity? Because if you need hot water and you have uh, many electricity, you can heat this water from electricity. But if you have from the district heating, you don't need to produce anymore because you just have it. Other important uh, uh, point is the the mobility in a smart city in every way the mobility uh, is uh, changing but this change goes focused only from the 90 percent uh, we have uh, some hydrogen from uh, this kind of energy but the 90 percent is electrical one but the problem of this electrical one in the technology of this electrical one is the batteries the technologies of the batteries is uh, too old. We have uh, two centuries and things like that, that we use always the same kind of battery. It's, it's true that actually we have the hydrogen and, the, and two other type of batteries, but in the market, in the photovoltaic and in every place in 90%, we use the normal batteries. And these batteries uh, goes down in five years, 10 years, depending, but it's not for the centuries, okay? And this is uh, about the technologies, but other thing that we have to think on it is uh, new ideas. Uh, one idea uh, for the cities, smart cities or pets or whatever, is to think on the tokens. Tokens, it will be a new blockchain or is something like the Bitcoin or something like that. In that case, uh, you produce N, for example, X energy in kilowatts per hour, and then you need the same for the other technologies. So if you use your tokens, you can change from the company and the company has to uh, be adapted to this uh, new idea, because otherwise, if you go only with kilowatts, something like that, depending on the hour or something like that, the person or the prosumer of, of this uh, smart city uh, never wins. You produce more energy that you're consuming, and you have to pay for it. This is... a uh, a new idea to change uh, uh, this sector. And for the heating sector, we have uh, another idea, is to need to renovate the organic waste, living in community and use this waste to produce energy. And this is the clean way to produce it. This is a kind of a thermal energy. Uh, from the waste one and if you go on a new technology say uh, a part of that we can produce a methane and from the methane we can go on the hydrogen and different technologies these are different technologies that we can produce it on the uh, same place that we are living but if we what happened if we don't have uh, uh, this capacity of uh, production we have to import the energy. From where, if it's close, it's better. This is uh, <laughs> it's true. But sometimes you have to consume the energy that you don't have and import it from different uh, parts, different countries, and sometimes from different continents. Uh, in this... Uh, in this situation, we don't have nothing to do, just only pay the bill. 
uh, but uh, the technology we can facilitate if you have a energy demand of the energy that you have to distribute in your town or in your building, because in that case, you can go uh, down the peaks and uh, don't pay for the high, uh, uh, high economic uh, levels of this uh, energy because it's in some hour that the peak is highest and you have to pay for it. If we, if we make an energy balance in, a, in any place, we can know uh, when we need our a limit renewable energy to use it in this special moment. And in this case, we can uh, coordinate it to, to, to do that. To, uh, our input is to, to take a unfortunate from the stakeholder that are, can facilitate and provide some plan with the facilities, the stakeholders. The local energy market, you have to try to optimize with algorithms. For example, if you go to energy consumption and try this to optimize these algorithms and how you can get the energy from the market if you don't have to contract but this is dependent only from the stakeholders. In a common city, you need to import an energy annually. You don't have a decision from which technology uh, come to energy that they are consumption. Normally, you just go to electrical, whatever, and you have the electrical one, but you don't decide nothing about the technology. And to the end, the energy storage is necessary and it's necessary to collaborate with the electric one, but you need to have a thermal storage if you live in a residence, in a residence sector and you can do it because you have this, uh, the capacity and the place to store it. I mean, you can store it from the at the, at the night and use it at the morning or something like that. Uh, for the heat, heating sector, uh, uh, another thing is the energy from the hydrogen production facilities to provide energy to the closed cities. For example, to have uh, energy production in, not in your city, but just uh, very close from your city and to can combine this, uh, this uh, energy from the hydrogen and, and from you, if you have, if you can uh, use the waste residues to produce methane, like I said before, in a, in a small, uh, in a smart city, and you can combine this hydrogen if you have the technology to use this hydrogen and you can produce it. This is a, and another a, because in any place you always are going to have a waste. And from this waste, you can use it and reduce it and comes out methane, hydrogen, whatever. Uh, and to the end, people who live in a smart city comes to be producers and it's become to improve the quality life. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. And now we have uh, Yelena Brajkovic uh, for Working Group 4. Uh, Yelena is uh, our uh, virtual networking manager. Uh, well, hello, everybody on Zoom and in person. Uh, so I will also try to be very, uh, very concise. Uh, so at our table, uh, our main topic was capacity building. But before that, uh, we talked uh, a little bit about PED in general. So all together at the table, we had people with very different backgrounds. We have uh, resilience officers from the municipalities. Uh, we had uh, architects planners, we had uh, people that are actually focusing on innovation in technology and sustainability. Uh, very interestingly, we also had energy uh, modeling for different scales. I think the, the topic of scales and how to implement PET solutions in any actually area to different scales 
is something that we should further develop within this uh, cost action. Then we had also people that were, had background in sociology and social sciences uh, from uh, doing, uh, how to say, advisory for uh, smart cities and related topics. Uh, then we had uh, uh, municipalities again uh, for planning and consulting. So we had very different uh, people with very big, different background. And I think our results were, uh, were actually reflecting this. Uh, also people that are dealing with project management and directors. So it was really a pleasure to discuss all these issues. So about the concept of PEDS, we received different answers. And uh, there were some uh, cities that were mentioned as implementing PEDS, which we can, uh, again, maybe dedicate some case studies to in these cost actions. Then uh, uh, something like collaborative energy management. This is also something that we can work on. What is this collaboration? What is this management? Who is managing which part? And everything else that you probably already heard in a way and in aspects from different tables. Of course, this is peer to peer. This is infrastructures and this is different scales and different stakeholders at different scales. Um, this should be further developed. Then of course, energy transition of already uh, uh, existing built environment and maybe proposals for strategies for uh, some areas that are not yet, of course, fully built. And of course, what could be at the top of this, of course, integrative integrative approach. Um, uh, what would be the results that we would be happy with? So this is first and before all to raise cons consciousness and awareness of all different stakeholders and different groups. And if we could uh, achieve self-management of energy resources, this would be a great success of this, of this not only this action, but the whole pet story. Uh, could people actually self-manage their own production and consumer, consumerism of energy, could they actually design their own districts? Uh, how could we educate these end users? This is a topic for itself. And how can we create uh, functional connections and collaboration and actually think about benefits for all? Because uh, uh, when we were discussing, there were of course problems with people not being motivated to participate or not uh, finding uh, what, what is there in their business uh, for them. And somehow we can actually connect all the dots and find benefits really for all businesses. And just to talk about goals like social or climate justice, this could be, of course, uh, this could be, let's say achieved only through very, very true, of course, uh, involvement of governments and proper incentives and proper legislation. And ma main problems in uh, implementing, of course, lack of financial means, lack of funding, and of course, uh, very limiting uh, legislation, which could be demotivational for some, for some stakeholders. So to come back to the questions that were actually built for our table, uh, first of them, uh, which target groups are needed to facilitate transition to PED and which specific empowerment could we give to, this, uh, to these groups? So of course we received different answers and I will try to cluster them. Uh, legislation writers, of course, then energy providers and end user groups, of course, professionals in the sector. Uh, one of the keywords from different uh, different interview interviewed uh, experts, of course, prosumers and uh, how can we actually motivate uh, people to to act like prosumers? And is there is there a lack of incentives here? And we got a very uh, interesting example from Sweden, where there is a cheap price of energy which is a little bit demotivational, of course, for people, but with some other things going on, uh, this, this really uh, uh, is becoming motivational for people to actually presume and then further sell their energy and of course save their energy and similar. Of course, uh, uh, through blockchains, we also received that answer. Uh, then for municipalities, uh, from municipalities, we had, of course, professionals from the practice which are not very familiar with the topic of PET. So then the question was, of course, how can we inform them? And of course, through organized meeting and networking events, uh, most uh, answers uh, that we received was of course in person because uh, not all online activities are how to say uh, tangible. So if it could be better organized at, at a very simple level uh, of in-person exchange of knowledge, that would be great, of course, uh, incentives. But then we received one interesting example of uh, incentives that uh, already exist in Italy, considering renovation. So maybe we can apply something similar, uh, uh, similar models to PET, maybe. Uh, 
how to inform then common people, something like pet tutors and maybe some emerging roles. So that could be maybe visible in districts, in different districts dealing with different social groups, which can advise people and give them basic knowledge or advanced knowledge about pet. How can we be inclusive? So pet mentality and ideas, um, they demand how to say that you must be owner of, of the land or of the building so that you can make decisions. But how can people who have a good will to deal with, with uh, energy, how can they do it if they actually don't have their own ownership or funds to, 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 to deal with these issues? And this, 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 uh, this topic is also one of the really uh, serious problems that could be solved through, again, different strategies. So how can we make energy community function for all, not only owners, how can we be inclusive? Of course, there is participatory design and we can engage people and very different groups through this, but this participatory design must be, of course, social sensitive, which means, again, that we must, must talk in different maybe language to different groups and motivate them in different ways. Uh, who can do this maybe the best municipalities they can reach easily to to end users and they can tackle this issue through economic benefits uh, also private sector uh, is uh, besides uh, prosumers besides municipalities and participatory design uh, private sector is identified of course as having uh, could be the one to empower of course different target groups very efficiently, non-profit organizations, local organizations, green NGOs. So basically this would mean from top down and down up approach. Benefits for private companies, what could this be? Uh, interesting idea was also mentioned, could be a pet could become a new service that could be actually offered and it could be implemented, could be a new working package or, uh, or how to say a piece of work that must be done when developing new districts and similar. For the second question, uh, what is needed to mobilize the stakeholder ecosystem on PED? We uh, received the uh, answers that again vary. So better incentives, um, again, this approach top to down, down to top and user communication about this and how can we motivate community to discuss energy and district strategies uh, from their own point of view. So how can we uh, raise this discussion among end, end, end users? Um, and this could be done, of course, through participatory, uh, adequate participatory design strategies. Uh, of course, districts where people have low income, for example, or similar, uh, they could connect uh, uh, with these questions through maybe some boosting income schemes, and this all could be actually designed in a proper way. If we would uh, be still developing living labs, living labs, and find um, common interest for all different stakeholders, uh, in-person talk with experts would also help. Maybe opening offices, temporary offices in the districts, but uh, surely. Um, providing physical spaces in which these conversations could be led and, and all issues solved. Uh, going to third question, how to implement capacity building among civil servants and urban doers? Of course, the main, main answer was education. We could uh, and we should raise awareness through cooperation, maybe regular meeting, meetings uh, and universities were identified as main uh, providers of, of these educational courses, but these courses should be designed for, uh, for different uh, groups. So it should be very, uh, how to say, easy approach, mini courses, uh, maybe weekend, uh, uh, some weekend courses, uh, and this concept is the concept of lifelong learning, but altogether workshops and um, some system maybe of also rewards or getting uh, diplomas for something and similar could be a nice nice idea of industry and the practice collaboration on this. Uh, how to support cross fertilization and cooperation among departments offices to align urban urban stakeholder ecosystem enhancing the role towards urban transition. Uh, of course, through project management was one of the answers. We just need a proper uh, management. And then we developed this, this, um, this topping into internal and of course, external management of, of offices and of departments. 
So also uh, clear responsibilities, clear roles and clear regulations and legislation that actually gives us the frame uh, frame uh, uh, to uh, do our internal management properly. Uh, also, uh, besides, of course, prom proper, proper management, uh, regular, regular networking was um, identified as very important. And lastly, uh, how to develop dedicated international peer-to-peer -peer learning process. Uh, answers were given, uh, went into different directions. So some said projects, of course, funded and supported by governments. Some say regional projects, interregional projects, where transfer of good practices from region to region would be established. This is something like twinning mentioned by few participants. So we have a teacher and we have a learner cities. This is a peer-to-peer -peer approach. We have mutual visits and exchanges of, of uh, knowledge and of course replication. So twinning for sure. Uh, we also mentioned database build up for what the cost is trying to do. Cost was also of course and cost programs were found as potential frameworks for, for uh, de developing pads. Uh, so this database base creation would be very helpful for people who have some certain barriers in their business to actually learn how others coped with it and which solutions were actually were actually successful. But who would be using this database and how it would actually reach uh, common 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 public? Of course, um, this should go through identifying national key points key stakeholders at maybe national levels, which uh, then from this could go uh, uh, to other scales. This is again a question of, of scale. So altogether, this database could come to end users, of course, through cities, and of course, from peer to peer, from, uh, from promotion, and of course, some certain infrastructure chain, some structural chain could be, uh, could be, could be maybe designed to actually, uh, deliver this database to end users and with this i will finish wrapping up of thank you very much. Thanks, excellent thank you yelena now we go to the virtual uh, mural session and i will ask uh, maybe alessandro to start open up uh, your yeah please your camera and microphone Alessandro Sacoluzzi is a PhD candidate in environmental technological design at the Department of Planning, Design, Technology of Architecture here in Sapienza University of Rome. Please, Alessandro. Okay, good afternoon. Well, after the brainstorming session, uh, I can say that uh, it is evident that many interesting ideas have emerged from this brainstorming Starting from cluster one, I understand that the debate has focused mainly on operational application of, techni of technical solutions uh, uh, due to their complexity and low compliance. Probably a reference can be found in PGT and climate plans. We need uh, support from public institutions and uh, also that uh, information that is not always uniform and homogeneous, which instead should be the basis for an effective uh, discussion. But also participation and cooperation between stakeholders, thanks, for example, to living labs, but also citizens who should be placed uh, at the center of innovation programs, because they are the first subject to whom those interventions refer. Uh, we need a bottom-up approach in uh, territory planning and the incentives uh, to facilitate the spread of pets and uh, offer concrete uh, stimuli. Uh, the question that has garnered the most interest in the first cluster is the number three, while uh, question number two was a little bit neglected. Furthermore, many interacted and, uh, and voted. And in the second cluster, many ideas are focused on uh, incentives in digital technologies, research and innovation, economic activities. But um, we can see a difficulty in inserting paths within the regulatory framework, which is not always up to date. Uh, collaboration between public and private is a topic that is always present, even in this case. Uh, however, there are many cases from abroad that can be taken uh, as an example. 
but uh, I can say that economic incentives and penalties to give a more precise direction to the economic and social development of the city and uh, also in this case we must invest in the awareness of citizens and uh, other ideas are focused on bureaucracy as a serious burden that limits technological innovation. Uh, participants gave a great value to all the questions, uh, especially number two in this second cluster. In the third cluster, uh, enabling technologies uh, is legible, a necessity of uh, respect for the environment and climate. And for this reason, we would need very specific professionals who are able to coordinate the technological implementation process. Uh, one of them is the energy aggregator. Uh, also, um, we need to improve energy production at uh, all stages of the process, uh, placing uh, renewable energy at the center of the energy program, uh, rest uh, on all levels of intervention from the city to the neighborhood, to the buildings, to the final sustainable and multi-scale energy balance. A smart approach as a reference and a replicable model, especially in metering, which is the system that allows to collect data and analyze trends. But um, another issue uh, was energy poverty and citizen awareness uh, that are not uh, often observed in the, in the discussion. Um, in, the, in the last cluster, um, there are offered a proposal on end users and needed to facilitate transition to PET, offering their vision uh, at an early stage. But also actors should have access to more and quality information. Uh, Roundtables for participation by subjects that are uh, as varied as possible but other ideas came from uh, um, disclosing the benefits uh, uh, is the key, but we need uh, robust data and credible figures who can highlight them through workshops, webinars, and lessons. Uh, website, uh, at the end, website and social media are currently the most accessible uh, platforms by extension and simplicity in order to support uh, the spread of, uh, of the work. Uh, I hope that I have captured all the information before uh, before leave the the world. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. And now Marco De Lipaoli. Marco De Lipaoli is equally a PhD candidate in environmental technological design here at the Department of Planning, Design, Technology, of Architecture, Sapienza University of Rome. Please, Marco. Thank you for the, the introduction. And uh, I will briefly summarize our work of these two hours uh, of activity. And uh, I thank all the participants in the brainstorming session. And for each cluster, we defined a key issue to work on and uh, some gaps uh, to bridge in order to achieve the energy transition. So uh, about the first, uh, about the cluster one, uh, uh, we think that a multi-level energy master planning is needed to define a general objectives for local administrations, uh, provide local energy communities. And uh, uh, one of the gap uh, uh, um, is about uh, monumental aspects of heritage context, for example, uh, but also um, is about uh, uh, the lack of coordination among the different programs of local administrations that uh, um, that that are in, uh, in, the, in the countries uh, in, uh, in Europe. And another gap, uh, but uh, maybe represents uh, one of the aim of the, of the research work is uh, to define a scheme to certificate a positive energy district because we have some protocols, uh, for example, like LEED uh, for uh, neighborhood, for example, uh, that uh, don't take into account uh, the city as a whole but the district as a part of the city, uh, as a single unit. Uh, so it uh, uh, doesn't take it into account the integration of the, um, the district inside the, the urban environment. 
Uh, moving on to cluster two, uh, we think uh, that uh, one of the requirements to obtain fundings uh, is to provide a clear effective action plans uh, based on the evidence of the design process in order to achieve the multi-level objectives. Um, provided by the first cluster, uh, focusing on the future investment, starting, for example, uh, from the renovation of the existing buildings, uh, reducing energy waste. Um, one of the suggestions is about earnings for municipalities from selling carbon quotes, for example, and also about co-financing by local authorities measured in energy saved and energy shift, not in the uh, budget and human finance, uh, human sources used uh, for the implementation of the project, uh, promoting results and benefits uh, deriving from a virtuous design process. And moving on the third cluster, um, uh, one of uh, the more relevant gap uh, is about uh, the technology integration in, in the existing buildings scenario, because uh, more of the 90% of buildings in 2050 need a deep energy renovation using more advantageous energy sources for the area in which they are to be used. Following the other brainstorming questions, so for example, about the energy flexibility, we could intend it like the energy flow between buildings and systems uh, to achieve a balance where the constraints could not be satisfied, uh, for example, in the existing building scenario. And about uh, uh, the last questions, uh, about the last question of the um, third cluster, uh, we provide energy building meters uh, uh, through type of sensors uh, that can be placed, for example, in the district uh, to have the evidence uh, of data to take in into account for implementing smart technologies. And at the end, we need to identify causes specific to energy poverty and not only to poverty, which should be considered as such. Working, for example, on passive strategies uh, uh, to reduce energy demand in buildings, uh, avoiding expensive costs for operational and maintenance phase of building the uh, life cycle. And uh, moving on the last uh, cluster, the cluster number four, uh, we have identified uh, the key issue in the uh, citizens uh, that are uh, a relevant part of the target group for uh, the energy transition, uh, because uh, uh, through the uh, awareness, uh, um, it's possible to facilitate the PED implementation and so uh, the planning of comfortable spaces related not only to the energy aspects, but also to the social ones. So taking into account an integration of uh, benefits that uh, um, are mm, evident in uh, in the uh, in the design process and uh, in the implementation of uh, of uh, of pets. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, before actually providing you with the final. Uh, with the final remarks on uh, uh, the last, third and last, uh, okay, third and last uh, table, we would like to mention uh, uh, the third PhD candidate in environmental technological design, Elena Gualandi. Elena uh, provided feedback uh, at the physical table here at the work cafe. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. So a quick, uh, um, I'll try and be fast, I've uh, been collecting on the third uh, mural uh, uh, question by question. So <laughs> be patient and stay with us. Uh, so on question one, which existing rules of spatial planning and zoning plans at local level can support transitions to PED. Uh, the gaps identified were um, that PED as a concept is still very much unknown in the planning instruments. Um, and some, instead of gaps, some proposal refers to zoning as a supporting energy production. Integrated approach PED that should inclu be included in the wider carbon neutral cities goal, which is uh, 
I will say something which is now recurring uh, uh, as a mantra as well. The National Energy and Climate uh, uh, Plan uh, as an existing tool already supporting transition to bed. Uh, question number two, how might we improve rules, regulation and programs uh, supporting PEDs and which gaps? Uh, certainly we need to simplify procedures. Uh, the existing uh, um, measure of 110%, which is in place in Italy, um, uh, incentives could be oriented to transition to PET, facilitating energy efficiency in all types of buildings uh, within positive energy districts, mapping tools at local scales linked to specific regulation and programs. Um, the necessity to identify PED in municipal uh, strategic plans, the necessary improvement of local laws, the encouragement of PED requirements for the construction of new neighborhoods and districts, the EU directive on local energy communities and renewable energy uh, community as a guide, uh, the gap is that there is no guidance for conceptualizing the government processes, including the individual roles. So, as far as how might we improve multi-level policy frameworks and which gap can you identify? Multi-level uh, policy frameworks implies cooperation and local knowledge uh, at different scales and integrated approaches should be taken. We need to allocate more economic uh, uh, resources, improve alignment uh, of policy frameworks at national level, focusing on missions. Uh, Decision-making is about dynamic combinations of sets of problems and solutions represented by different actors and different exogenous factors, such as political and governmental priorities and contextual differences. In terms of protocols and standards that must be adopted to validate, assess, and monitor and calculation on annual energy balance on PED, uh, certification is important, but standards may be difficult to adapt to emerging concepts uh, uh, such as PEDs. And protocol may need revision in order to be used for PED. Interoperability protocols and standards needed to validate the PEDs. In terms of identification of investment concepts able to accelerate transition to positive energy districts, uh, time risk and return on investment to be taken into account to identify and promote pet specific investment concept, use incentives instead of polluters pay principles, opportunity for residents to provide valuable flexibility to districts and neighborhoods, differentiate funders according to time and expectation in terms of return on the investment, support of local and national administration in the initial investment, uh, the European city facility that we also heard today uh, from uh, the Qashqai's uh, experience, the possibility of economic return derived from production activity within the PED. In terms of innovating in funding and business model in order to take advantage of financial sources different from EU grants or municipality fund, uh, fundings, especially in funding, it is very important to explore and attract uh, different funders, uh, bridging risk profiles and time frame. The gap that I see is how to innovate in funding and business model, presenting and promoting PED initiatives the same way um, we do to, to, um, to the same funders of business as usual projects. I couldn't agree more on that. Involving and encouraging private investors, national or foreign, is extremely important. Financial resources from the EU need to be better understood incentivize private investment through the concession and management of specific services within the PED. 
in terms of incorporating the financial and private sector to increase the public budget and private investment in PED, which gaps uh, can you identify? In some countries, the private sector already accounts for the majority of job, new job creation and availability of funds. Considering this crucial role, specific attention to this category of funders should be paid. Building specific capacity building initiative is crucial. Public budget should be consciously allocated among priorities. The gap is the prior in priority settings. Many countries uh, structurally uh, public uh, plan investment for the implementation of PED. Municipalities expectation that funds should come only through dedicated EU programs implies overestimating their capabilities to be successful in every competitive programs. Uh, in terms of designing financial mechanisms that help overcome conflicting budget allocation across the scales, European, national, regional, and local, and bridge it between benefits for the community or return on private investment. There is a lot to do in terms of identification uh, to support energy transition uh, through business model and sustainable urban development. Virtual examples could come from other sectors, such as sustainable water management at different scales. Possibility of allocating more or less resources according to the quality of every single technological aspect, whether management, energy, and waste, as examples. And which energy efficiency technologies are related to support transition to PED according to the different contexts, such as uh, renewable energy systems, heritage existing versus new buildings, e-mobility, smart technologies. One possible gap refers to the concept of PED itself, and, uh, which means that it's not only uh, referring to energy efficiency, but a more holistic and comprehensive approach is needed. Um, it is needed to support innovative technology of energy efficiency, such as uh, um, human energy source through, through to specialized information, publication and conferences, and public information to citizens through public programs and city uh, boards to encourage uh, participation. Encourage the use of energy efficiency technologies according to the building types and smart technologies. In terms of energy flexibility technologies that are needed to support transition to PED according to the different context. Uh, with the European city, we have already identified gaps uh, this morning, but equally lesson learned referring to exploring flexibility in different meaning for the benefit of our community. Ontology is needed to support uh, flexibility. And which energy production technologies are needed to support transition to PED according to the different context? One gap here refers to the difficulties cities often face when looking for space to allocate renewables. Um, gaps here can possibly be related to regulation, cluster one in terms of conf conflict for the urban space uh, that is very scarce. Uh, if confronted with the many claims municipality have to cope with. The gap that I see here refers to the constraints of locating energy production in existing urban fabrics, difficulties in existing cities to find space for renewable energy sources. Uh, which smart technologies are needed to validate calculation on annual uh, energy balance on PED? Uh, the first gap for heritage sites is management of rules and technology at the same time for making heritage sites to smart city, which is really challenging. There is no standard to calculate the positivity of energy balance at the district level. The energy flows between the buildings and energy system are very case specific and often very complex. Standards can, can help, by, but may not be user-friendly and interpretable. Uh, that is, which, as an example, which primary energy factor should be used. Uh, and then uh, for energy uh, communities. 
uh, how to tackle affordability of housing and contrast energy poverty through enabling technologies. The concept of appropriate technology should guide us here. Cities face social problems and contrasting energy poverty is a clear priority. Local administration must provide incentives through form of support, including economic ones to promote accessibility to housing and contrast energy poverty. In terms of housing affordability, cities have to plan and design specific measures for that, examples of useful measures already exist in Europe, and upscale and knowledge transfer is crucial. And then get in contact uh, with an action working on energy poverty. Uh, zero poverty is a very comprehensive uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, and as such should be dealt with by the municipalities and governance bodies. In terms of target groups needed to facilitate transition to PED, with which specific empowerment, citizen, as they need to understand and support the PED initiatives, prosumers, local awareness session, they should already be good practice, as many target groups as possible, but the problem is first a correct identification of stakeholders, the gap is in local knowledge, the gap is how to involve local communities, lack of a model or structure for community engagement, absence of appropriate infrastructure for transparency of strategies and policy. The gap is lack of trust and knowledge, involve local administration and the whole energy chain. What is needed to mobilize stakeholder ecosystem on PED, a vision explaining why they should be part of the process, a platform to facilitate communication and coordination. More initiative at local level are needed. Gap is in local knowledge. There are several stakeholder ecosystems that must be identified. To train the staff of the administrations in order to create a national communication and coordination network improving the knowledge of local administrators, and it is necessary to mobilize civil servants. How to implement capacity building among civil servants and urban doers? Communication often get lost in translation. Facilitators are needed as well as local expertise to bridge interests and prioritize requests and needs peer-to-peer -peer exchange and pair ambassador. How to support the cross-fertilization and cooperation among departments, offices, to align urban stakeholder ecosystem, enhancing their role towards urban transition, setting joint goals could be a good way of making departments and offices cooperating, promote exchanges among different departments setting joint goals, structure specific activity. How to develop dedicated international peer-to-peer -peer learning processes. Moving peer-to-peer -peer up to an international level is a huge gap as several barriers exist, uh, such as communication skills, different priority settings, competencies in providing education services. A first step could be to approach and invite international working group members to the action but I don't think we were referring to researchers though. And the gap is according to the definition of peer. We researchers, I don't see many problems with community, public officers, practitioners, and industry players. There are many more gaps to be identified. And this is it for, for the 18 uh, brainstorming questions. Thank you for, for, your, for being patient with me. Um, and I would like to, to ask uh, either the, the people here with us today and or uh, people uh, attending online. So if you, if you have or questions, please. Uh, I think you are all very, very tired after a very long and dense day. I don't see comments from the chat. So the last uh, uh, things sorry, to accomplish. Sorry, may I just uh, 
Um, I would like to put emphasis on uh, three keywords that uh, have been mentioned uh, concerning municipalities and the rural municipalities, uh, which from my point of view represent the, 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 the gap uh, and, uh, and the, the challenge that uh, must be considered for the future. Um, these three words, power, capacity, and resources. So I think that, um, I, I think uh, Helena synthesized this. Uh, so thank you very much for this contribution. Uh, I think that uh, my, my proposal to you is to, to keep these three words in mind. So power, capacity and resources, because these uh, three um, resume the, the gap that we discuss and, um, and think maybe uh, if uh, we can work on these three words and uh, uh, what type of, uh, of, uh, of work we can develop on this. So this is my final consideration when, when I heard about this, <laughs> something came in my mind. So. Thank That's you. All. Thank you, Paul. I think it's an excellent synthesis because sometimes also we, we get lost in several interpretations of the concepts. So keywords <laughs> always come uh, helping us in that. So I will uh, still ask Paola to um, tell us something more about what is happening tomorrow before relaxing for the evening. Yes. So I hope that you enjoy the, the day, first of all. Uh, starting this morning, uh, we, we talk about an ideal fil rouge that link uh, all these two days. So uh, today we have had a type of experience and tomorrow uh, in, in the same uh, direction, we will host a different type of event. So uh, we will start in the morning with uh, two presentations, two colleagues of mine uh, in the NEA. Uh, Gilda Massa uh, will uh, introduce uh, um, how data uh, um, and uh, assessment tool can support uh, local authorities uh, at national level, so to facilitate transition towards sustainable urban areas, which I, I put in evidence, uh, PED are one approach of uh, this uh, uh, transition. And then uh, Matteo Caldera will present a web-based tool, which is named Recon, and uh, it's a facilitator, again, for public uh, uh, local authorities uh, and municipalities to verify if uh, it is possible to, to, to facilitate the creation of uh, um, uh, energy communities. Then we have decided together, uh, Maria Beatrice, to create three type of um, different presentation. Okay. Uh, the first one, uh, all the three uh, presentation are named stakeholder talks. The first one will collect presentation of uh, um, 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 person who works in the area of real estate and uh, the whole chain of energy, so from the production to the distribution and utilities. Um, I think it's extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, then we have a, a specific presentation uh, on an association of small municipalities, because of course, due to the particularity of Italy, it is not, uh, it could happen that uh, several small municipalities want to join to create a district. So I think this could be an interesting approach. Uh, we have asked to all stakeholders to make a presentation, but then start or uh, conclude with the gaps. So um, this will be their contribution. Then tomorrow, then after these talks, we will have a selected Italian experience. It has been very difficult to decide uh, how, uh, who invite or not. This doesn't mean that they are the only one, of course. Uh, uh, they have been selected because we have uh, several activity in place with them. Uh, 
Um, and so uh, they will again make the presentation highlighting gaps. Yes, and then uh, in the afternoon, uh, we will again uh, change topic uh, with session seven, we go directly to action plans. We will be enjoying two uh, keynotes. The first one from Hans Gunther Schwarz, Strategic Coordinator for Research on Energy and Urban Technologies. And the second one from Ch Francesco Puntillo, partner and co-head of Energy and Infrastructure of the legal and consulting firm Gianni and Origoni. Uh, on corporate finance and regulatory matters. Uh, again, back to um, different uh, kind of input and perspective on funding a business model, which uh, we think is, is still one of the very difficult uh, topic for, for pets to understand. And, and especially if we come into action, if we want to understand what cities, municipalities, stakeholders have to do. This is, is something which is still slippery as a concept. And so we want to have specific uh, um, presentation from uh, Angelo Giordano and the Sparks uh, experience from uh, uh, Bocconi Green in terms of activating uh, uh, through funding and business model, uh, the uh, ur sustainable urban transition. Uh, again, Andy uh, Carvonen from Transped uh, in our uh, guest in person, Joao Dinis for the municipality of Cascais. Uh, sorry, I would like to put in emphasis the presentation of Ars Gunther Schwarz, as actually uh, I have mentioned it during the lunch time. Uh, you know that uh, the, the European uh, funding uh, uh, framework has a slightly change with Horizon Europe. Uh, and um, the, the, the original, we had a lot of, uh, we as JPI Urban Europe promoted several calls, even concerning the topic of PED. But now, uh, thanks to Horizon Europe, uh, we have a new uh, funding scheme. And basically, uh, it, has been uh, it has been created the, 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 the scheme of partnership. So in this framework, uh, uh, we have a partnership which is called Driving Urban Transition. And this partnership will be the main uh, which will promote uh, um, calls and other activity concerning municipality. So Hans Gunther Schwarz, uh, the, the uh, Driving Urban Transition Partnership is a coalition of funding agency. So uh, funding agency with, who want to um, provide uh, money for the development of calls and other activity. And Hans Gunther Schwarz tomorrow will present to you the contents of this partnership, highlighting next opportunities in the coming years. Excellent. After that, uh, um, Paula and I will try to wrap up and with your help uh, reach some uh, hopefully uh, concrete conclusions of our workshops and also try and delineate possible way forward. So thank you very much for your active participation today. And we wish you a pleasant evening. It's not raining anymore and there is a nice <laughs> uh, sunshine. So I hope you will enjoy the October in Rome, uh, which is normally not like the way you, you saw it. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Uh, try to remember there is always this uh, uh, check at the entrance, so try and arrive maybe five minutes uh, before nine o'clock. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>